from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning, everyone, and greetings from the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Jane Deeb. I'm the interim director for the Kluge Center, and uh, my other hat, I'm the chief of the African Middle East Division here at the Library of Congress. So we're delighted to see you all. What a wonderful audience. And I, before I make some brief remarks, I would also ask you all to silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices. Um, because, well, today's program is being filmed for the Library of Congress and the Kluge Center websites, as well as for future placement on the library's YouTube and iTunes channels. And also today's program is being live streamed by the NASA Astro Astrobiology Institute. So we welcome viewers watching us from around the world. Okay, so this program today is co-sponsored by both the NASA Astrobiology Institute and by the Kluge Center. So let me tell you a few things about each of those institutions. About the John Kluge Center, uh, that one, that uh, center was established through a generous endowment from philanthropist John Kluge. The Library of Congress established that center in 2000 to bring together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another and to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources and collections and to interact with policymakers in Washington. The Kluge Center invites and welcomes senior scholars to the library and provides space where they can uh, take full advantage of one of the world's largest repositories of knowledge in pursuit of their academic studies and uh, in various uh, fields. The center is also the home of the Henry Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and International Relations, the Jack Camp Chair in Political Economy, and of course, the NASA chair in astrobiology. The NASA chair in uh, astrobiology is, um, it was set up by the Baruch uh, Bloomberg NASA um, uh, program. And uh, it was established as a focus in the nation's capital for the exploration of issues surrounding life's collective future in the universe for humans and other species on Earth and beyond. The program catalyzes discussions and reflection on the impact of discovering whether there is life beyond our planet and on the implication of such discoveries. Of course, we'll be spending two days discussing this issue, so I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to go further and talk about this. But I want to say uh, a few words about um, the chair, which takes its name from Nobel Prize winner Baruch Barry Bloomberg, the founder of the Institute. Dr. Bloomberg uh, envisioned a senior scholar position within the Kluge Center that would examine the scientific discoveries of astrobiology within the context of the humanities and social sciences. And Astrobiology Chair is an example of the profound and varied significant subjects of research enabled by the Library of Congress's collections. Thanks and recognitions go to those who set it up. And I want primarily to recognize Dr. Mary Wojtek here, who has been uh, such an important, um, uh, who played such an important role in, his, in uh, getting uh, the program uh, further on, also Carl Pilcher and Ed Gulish of NASA, and of course, uh, Dr. Carolyn Brown, who uh, retired, uh, but she was the former director of the Kluge Center. And um, I also want to recognize, of course, the person you all know here, uh, Dr. Stephen Dick, for his tenure as Bloomberg Chair, 
Uh, he's a collegial scholar, bringing a wealth of knowledge and good humor to the Kluge Center, but he's going to be uh, introduced uh, a bit later. And um, now I would like to uh, introduce um, Congressman Lamar Smith. Uh, he has been the force behind it from across the road here, from Capitol Hill. U.S. Representative Lamar Smith represents the 21st Congressional District of Texas. He serves as chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which has jurisdiction over programs at NASA, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Science Foundation, the Federal, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's quite a, <laughs> quite a portfolio. He's a fifth generation Texan and a native of San Antonio. Congressman Smith graduated from Yale University and Southern Methodist University of Law. Uh, he has been a great friend of the library's astrobiology program, and we are honored to have him offer welcome remarks uh, this year, as he has last year. In December 2013, Congressman Smith organized the first congressional hearings on the current state of astrobiology research and the search for biosignatures in our solar system and beyond. So uh, we are happy to welcome him here, Congressman Lamar Smith. Dr. Dean, thank you very much for that nice introduction. And Dr. Stephen Dick, thank you for inviting me to be here today as well. This is our second annual, uh, though I mentioned to someone a while ago, it feels like the fifth or sixth annual. Uh, but that's a credit to you because we're talking about the subject so often. And uh, Dr. Dave, I wanted to mention to you that we've now had a total of three hearings in this Congress on astrobiology as well. And that's just the beginning. We have a long ways to go, but that's, it's the most fascinating subject to me. And I've been reading books about it for years, including several books by Seth Shostak. Uh, for a long time as well. And let me mention to you all today uh, that you're going to be hearing from the experts shortly during the course of the program. Uh, I am not one of those experts. I am simply their cheerleader. And I'm happy to cheer them on on such, as I say, such a fascinating uh, subject. I um, also want to mention and regret that I'm going to have to leave fairly shortly because we have scheduled another hearing of the uh, of the committee for early this morning, so, but I have Allison Rose who will be taking good notes for me, who's a, a staff member of the committee too. Um, there's a reason why over eight million people visit the National Air and Space Museum every year. And by the way, it's the most popular museum in America. Space exploration captures the imagination of Americans and encourages future generations to dream big, work hard, and shoot for the stars. Space exploration is an investment in our nation's future, often the far distant future. I don't know if space is the final frontier. I do believe it is the next frontier. New scientific discoveries are being made within our solar system. The Curiosity rover has confirmed that Mars once had liquid water on its surface. The Cassini spacecraft has provided us with new insights about the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. The New Horizons mission will tell us more about the dwarf planet Pluto and a proposed mission to Jupiter's moon Europa could answer questions about whether or not life might exist in its sub-ice sea. The study of other planets in our solar system also tells us about our own planet. As described in the July 2014 cover article for National Geographic, scientists are finding life in places on this planet where previous generations thought life would never exist. These discoveries have led us to broaden our concepts about which planets may contain life and the kind of life we might find there. We are also beginning to study planets outside of our solar system. The search for exoplanets and Earth-like planets is a relatively new but inspiring area of space exploration. Scientists are discovering new kinds of planets and solar systems in our own galaxy that we never knew existed. The discovery of Earth-like planets 
will open up new opportunities for American astronomers and explorers. And some of these planets could even contain the first evidence of organic life outside of Earth. According to a poll commissioned by the National Geographic Channel, over 60% of Americans believe that life exists on other planets. The United States pioneered the field of astrobiology and continues to lead the world in this type of research. The publication of scientific findings illustrates the field's growth and growing popularity in the past 20 years. In 1995, fewer than 50 papers were published on astrobiology. By 2012, that number had increased to more than 500. In 1995, fewer than 500 scientific reports cited astrobiology, but by 2012, it was almost 12,000. To date, almost 1,000 planets have been found by the Kepler Space Telescope. Last April, astronomers discovered the first Earth-like planet orbiting its star at a distance where liquid water could be present, a key factor for hosting life. The discovery of even microbes on planets within our solar system or beyond would be the most newsworthy story in decades. It could affect the way we view our place in the universe, and it could create increased interest in the core disciplines that fall under the umbrella of astrobiology, including chemistry, physics, geology, and biology. Even if we don't find life immediately, we are inspiring students to study science, technology, engineering, and math. These are fields that all certainly help students succeed in the future and help America remain on the cutting edge of innovation. Cooperation between NASA's space-based telescopes like the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope and the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite and ground-based telescopes funded in part by the National Science Foundation has enabled astronomers to expand their star-gazing capabilities. The Science Committee regularly holds hearings on the future of human spaceflight the search for exoplanets and the exploration of the universe for signs of life and the development of new telescopes and spacecraft that will enable us to learn more about our planet and the universe. In fact, last year, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee held 18 hearings on space. One of the most consequential pieces of legislation produced by our committee is the NASA Authorization Act. It provides overall guidance for the agency. In addition to pursuing our exploration of Mars, the bill includes a provision for a mission to Europa with a goal of launching by 2021. The bill also instructs the NASA administrator to enter into an arrangement with the National Academies of Science to develop a long-term strategy for astrobiology research. And that's the first time that has been specifically mentioned in the NASA bill. The committee passed the NASA Authorization Act with a unanimous bipartisan vote and over 400 Republicans and Democrats came together to endorse the consensus bill on the House floor. The vote was actually 401 to 2. Uh, you might wonder about those two. I did, uh, and I accosted one on the House floor uh, who happened to be a member of the Science Committee. I said, why did you vote against the NASA bill? And he said, well, I lost my primary in Georgia yesterday, and I'm voting against everything. So uh, <laughs> don't try to figure out who that was, but that explains one, and I'm sure the other one was equally explainable. Uh, uh, the, the committee passed NASA Authorization Act uh, with a unanimous bipartisan vote. Like I said, over 400 Republican and Democrats voted for it. But this exemplifies the overwhelming support by Congress for the U.S. to remain a world leader in space. This support is reflected on both sides of the Capitol and on both sides of the aisle. We look forward to working with the Senate to pass a bill that will be signed into law by the President. And by the way, sometimes uh, serendipitous uh, meetings occur. And last night I was at the White House, um, uh, they called it the White House uh, picnic. And I ran into Bill Nelson, uh, Senator Bill Nelson, who is shepherding the NASA bill through the Senate. And he said, we hope to hotline uh, the NASA bill uh, this week, meaning get it through the Senate this week without any dissent. And then he and I are going to work on trying to iron out the differences between the Senate and the House bill and pass it in the lame duck session. So it was nice to have that conversation with uh, Bill last night. And it does look like the prospects for more than a single year, a multi-year uh, reauthorization of NASA might well occur in November or December. Space exploration goes beyond rockets and avionics. It is about inspiration and discovery. And I hadn't thought about it until just a few minutes ago coming up the steps, but there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful quote by the 
poet Robert Browning uh, when he wrote, oh, that a man's uh, reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? And sometimes that's what we do with our exploration and our study of the cosmos. Human spaceflight, robotic exploration, and space science represent the highest aspirations and greatest ambitions of the American people. So thank you for being a part of that effort. Thank you for being experts, and thank you for your interest, and good to be with you today. Thank you, Congressman Lamar Smith. Uh, thank you for your inspiring uh, comments. Um, uh, we're all very grateful for your presence here today. And now to um, the um, other uh, pole of our uh, cooperation uh, with the NASA Astrobiology Program, we have with us today Dr. Mary Wojtek who took charge of NASA's astrobiology program on September 15, 2008, as a senior scientist for astrobiology in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Dr. Wojtek came to NASA from the U.S. Geological Survey in Reston, Virginia, where she headed the USGS Microbiology and Molecular Ecology Laboratory. Dr. Wojtek's primary research interest is aquatic microbial ecology and biogeochemistry. She has studied environmental controls on microbial transformations of nutrients, xenobiotics, and metals in freshwater and marine systems. She has worked in several extreme environments, including Antarctica, the Arctic, hypersaline lakes, deep sea hydrothermal events, and terrestrial deep surface sites. She has served on several advisory groups to the Department of the Interior, the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and NASA, including the Planetary Protection Subcommittee. She has also supported NASA's astrobiology program, serving as a NASA representative to a number of CO SPAR convened studies exploring the potential for life in the universe. She has held numerous positions in several science societies and is currently a board member of the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Mary Vaitak. Well, I'm going to keep my comments short, and I must say that I think Congressman Smith, um, if he ever decides to leave politics, can have my job. He did a fantastic job describing um, the excitement associated with studying astrobiology and the search for life and uh, recognizing all the work that NASA has done. Um, I'll just point out for those in the audience that don't realize that this has been uh, an enterprise for NASA for over 50 years. We've had uh, funded research in understanding the origin and evolution of life on Earth, looking at all the places that we might find it here, categorizing its limits, um, looking for unusual habitats and mapping that to other places in the universe. Um, more, uh, more recently, close in within our own solar system and now looking further to planets that, that orbit other stars out besides our own. Um, I think Lamar Smith also mentioned all of the um, planned missions, all the discoveries we've been making. I will actually, since we've on numerous occasions recognized that there's water on Mars, I will point out that um, Curiosity has actually shown evidence of uh, water bodies, of lakes, of rivers, not just finding hydrated chemicals or evidence of water having to have been there because of the chemistry that we observe, but actually geomorphological features that show that there are actually environments um, with water in it that could have supported life in the past, and that's extremely exciting to us. Curiosity also was able to make the first measurement 
of, um, of geochronology off of Earth. So it, they were able to actually date the environment they were sampling in and also make uh, an estimate of how recently the surfaces that they were um, sampling had been uncovered due to weathering processes on the surface of the planet. And these are all fantastic um, discoveries that we've made. And, and as our uh, symposium today is called Preparing for Discovery. NASA has been involved in preparing for the discovery from the scientific point of view. We've been funding this research. I've just mentioned several things our missions has, have observed. And today's symposium is going to talk about how um, people beside the science um, in all walks of life around the world um, are preparing for amazing discoveries like finding life and even finding something like a lowly microbe, which of course I think is tremendously exciting since I spent most of my um, research life looking for life in strange places, um, all the way through to you know, complex life and maybe even intelligent life. So I appreciate the program that Steve has put together. And I think we're going to, looking towards having a really enjoyable and informative two days. So with that, I'll turn it over to you or the introduction that comes for you. So thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you, Mary, for your comments. My name is uh, Dan Torello. I'm a program specialist at the, at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. And it is my great honor this morning to introduce our NASA Library of Congress Bloomberg Chair in Astrobiology. That's always a mouthful. As you may well imagine, a full rendering of Stephen's CV would require many, many pages and far more time than we have this morning. Uh, so in the interest of moving things forward, I'm going to highlight a few of the salient moment, moments from his distingu distinguished career. Steve received a Bachelor of Science in Astrophysics from Indiana University, and then an MA and a PhD in the History and Philosophy of Science, also from IU. For 24 years, Stephen worked as an astronomer and historian of science for the United States Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., including three years at the Naval Observatory's Southern Hemisphere Station in New Zealand. It was during this time that he wrote the history of the observatory, the first national observatory of the United States, which was published as Sky and Ocean Joined, the U.S. Naval Observatory, 1830 to 2000. In 2003, Stephen was named Chief Historian for NASA, and during this period, Steve wrote, uh, among other areas, about the importance of exploration for society and edited several volumes on the societal impact of spaceflight. Steve is the author of 19 books and numerous articles on the topics of astrobiology, astronomy, and the history of science. He is the recipient of the NASA Exceptional Service Medal, the Navy Meritorious Civilian Service Medal, the NASA Group Achievement Award, and the 2006 Leroy Doggett Prize for Historical Astronomy. Last but not least, I can tell you without the shadow of a doubt, I've never had the good fortune of introducing someone who had a planet named after them. Uh, but this, in fact, was exactly what happened in 2009. The International Astronomical Union uh, designated minor planet 6544 Stephen Dick in his honor. I will add on a personal note, uh, Stephen has brought a wealth of wisdom and scholarly goodwill to the library and to the Kluge Center. Uh, he has been collegial and most generous with his time, and we are deeply grateful for his many contributions, uh, not the least of which has been to gather such a distinguished group of scholars from all over the world uh, at the Kluge Center for our conference these next two days. So without further ado, please welcome Stephen Dick. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see such a big crowd here already this morning. Um, we've been waiting for this day for a long time. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dan for the introduction, uh, Mary and uh, Chairman Smith, and particularly uh, Chairman Smith for his sustained interest in astrobiology as evidenced by the two or three uh, congressional hearings on astrobiology that have been held over the last year. In both of those, uh, or at least two of those uh, uh, 
hearings, the question came up, what do we do if we find life? What would the impact be on society? And uh, that's what we are here to discuss over the, the next few days. Uh, we've brought uh, scholars here from around the country and around the world to uh, talk about this subject, are preparing for discovery a rational approach to the impact of finding microbial complex and intelligent life beyond Earth. That title, you may be able to tell, was carefully crafted uh, to emphasize several things. Uh, first of all, uh, this is not your usual astrobiology meeting uh, where technical aspects are discussed in minute detail. Those are important meetings, we have them all the time, but this meeting is really about the humanistic aspects of astrobiology, particularly preparing for life, uh, preparing for finding life, and the potential impact uh, if we do. And secondly, we say that it's a, a rational approach what that means, we'll see as we go along here, but uh, I, to me it means at a minimum a uh, systematic, uh, scholarly, and thorough attempt at tackling the problem, uh, making use of knowledge from a wide variety of uh, disciplines. So you'll find on the program not only scientists, but also a lot of philosophers, because they're the ones who look at the foundations of what we believe are concepts. You'll find uh, theologians, uh, historians, anthropologists, so a very broad array of scholars here. And thirdly, I want to emphasize that this is not just a meeting, uh, as Mary said, about, uh, about uh, the search for intelligence or the impact of, of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but also about microbial and complex life. Um, you, you never know, uh, but uh, many of us consider that microbes will be found first, um, certainly if it's a NASA discovery, because that's NASA's focus on uh, astrobiology and its program at present. And as Mary said, I think the discovery of even microbial life beyond Earth would be uh, perhaps the, uh, the greatest discovery uh, in the history of science. Uh, the impacts uh, would be great, maybe not as great as if something started talking back to us, but still I think uh, the, the, to find a microbe would be an indication that uh, life may be common in the universe, at least if it's a, a second genesis. So. Why are we uh, undertaking this subject at this time? It admittedly is a pretty far out subject, but it's only far out until you actually discover it, right? Then it's not far out and you have to figure out what to do. So uh, as uh, Seth Shostak will tell us in his first talk, uh, current advances in astrobiology, I think, make it prudent that we examine uh, the societal impact uh, and prepare for a discovery. Um, so let me see. Uh, these have already, uh, items have already been mentioned both by Mary and by uh, Chairman Smith, but uh, we're being driven uh, in this direction of preparing for discovery because all of these things are happening in astrobiology, which is a very uh, robust uh, discipline these days. The, you've all, you all have heard about the thousands of planets are being found beyond our solar system. Uh, they're beginning to look at possible biosignatures in the atmospheres of those planets. Uh, organics on Mars, Titan, and in interstellar molecular clouds, not life itself, but the building blocks of life. Uh, deep oceans on the Jupiter, uh, the Jovian satellite of Europa, and the Saturnian satellite of Enceladus, where you have water, you may have life. Um, and uh, the extremophile life on Earth, life in extreme environments, uh, uh, really um, a new thing over the last several decades. And finally, of course, the searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, which many of you know about from the radio searches, which I'm sure uh, we have several people here from the SETI Institute. I'm sure uh, Seth will be talk talking about that. So you might say, well, why not just wait until we make the discovery and worry about it at, the, at that point? Uh, Arthur C. Clarke had something to say about that. Uh, he thinks that back in writing in the 70s, it's so likely that it's safest to assume that they are out there. Uh, and to consider the manner in which this fact may impinge on human society. And if you don't want to believe Arthur C. Clarke, you can go back to the um, National Academy of Sciences all the way back in 1962 when exobiology was being founded. Uh, the National Academy report in 1962 said that what is at stake is a, a chance to gain a new perspective on humanity's place in, the, in nature, a new level of discussion on the meaning and nature of life. So there are very large uh, stakes here in, in uh, this discovery. So I think given these, given these latest developments in astrobiology, it's uh, high time that we look systematically at this problem of astrobiology in society, just as other uh, areas of science do, 
and I want to emphasize that uh, the, you know, societal impact is a part of uh, what is looked at with regard to uh, scientific advances in other areas, such as the Human Genome Project, which has a, had a, and still has a very robust ethical, legal, and societal impact research program. Three to five percent of its budget, uh, its three billion dollar budget, went towards those studies. The National Science Foundation has a technology and science uh, and society program. Uh, it has a center, other, other programs like the Center for Nanotechnology and Society. Uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science has a societal impacts of science and engineering uh, session. Uh, the NASA Astrobiology uh, Institute uh, has a, an astrobiology and society uh, focus group, which we'll be hearing more about. And of course, as you heard from Chairman Smith, Congress is interested in what the impact might be. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, here. Uh, also, uh, in terms of NASA itself, I interpret this part of the NASA Aeronautics and Space Act of 1958 to say that NASA should be talking about uh, the societal impact of its discoveries. And the NASA History Office has published several volumes on the societal impact with uh, one, at least one more forthcoming in the, in the near future. Uh, also, uh, if you're interested in looking more at this astrobiology and society uh, problem, you can look at the specialist issue of astrobiology a journal in 2012 uh, with this article about building an interdisciplinary scientific, uh, an interdisciplinary research community studying these aspects, uh, but also this entire issue is devoted to the history and philosophy of uh, astrobiology. So today we're going to be looking at frameworks for approaching the problems of discovery and impact, uh, as well as how we can try and get out of our heads and transcend anthropocentrism in looking at concepts like life and intelligence and culture and civilization and technology and communication. And tomorrow we'll look more specifically at the philosophical, religious, cultural, and practical impacts of finding uh, extraterrestrial life. So keep in mind that these questions are, uh, that we'll be asking are foundational. We're looking at the very roots of our ideas, some of our most cherished concepts, including what it means to be human. If you're looking for extraterrestrial life out there, it forces you to look back at us and what it means uh, to be human. And I maintain, I've always maintained that even in the unlikely event that we never discover uh, life out there, I think these kinds of questions are worth asking because astrobiology forces us to look at ourselves from this foundational perspective. You've already heard about uh, Baruch Blumberg. I'd like to dedicate this symposium to uh, Barry Blumberg, whose chair I now hold here at the Library of Congress. Um, as was mentioned before, Barry uh, won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1976 for isolating the hepatitis B virus, uh, for developing the vaccine, and then for giving it away to the world, uh, work that has saved millions of lives. Uh, he was also the first director of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and many of us remember him fondly for his passionate interest in that subject, not only uh, for the science, but also for the societal uh, aspects that we'll be discussing here over the next few days. Uh, Barry always liked to think of astrobiology as exploration in the tradition of Lewis and Clark, and so I would like for us to consider this symposium in that light as well as exploration, pushing the envelope of knowledge into new uncharted territory, wherever that may uh, lead. And that's what this meeting uh, here to, over the next two days is all about. So before uh, I turn this over to Seth, let me also thank the Library of Congress, which I found to be just a totally magnificent place to do research uh, with the people, the resources. Um, and I wanted particularly to thank the staff of the John W. Kluge Center, uh, especially Carolyn Brown, who was recently retired, uh, but also Joanne Kitching, uh, some of you are familiar with, Jason Steinhauer, Dan Torello, and all the rest of the staff, you know who you are. Uh, this meeting could not have happened without, uh, without uh, their uh, input. Uh, finally, I want to thank, before we go on, to thank the uh, NASA uh, Astrobiology Program and the Astrobiology Institute for their support and uh, for the live webcast uh, today. Um, Finally, my thanks to all the speakers for coming from around the country and around the world. And so I think uh, with that, uh, we'll begin the program with Seth, Seth Shostak's overview. Uh, Seth is the uh, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute out in Mountain View, California. Uh, he has his doctorate in astronomy from Caltech. I like to think of him as the great communicator because he always uh, does a great job in communicating uh, the science 
uh, and he's always uh, very uh, lively and, and informative. So, um, and he was one of the ones who uh, testified just last May before Chairman Smith's uh, committee on, uh, on the subject of astrobiology. So Seth, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thanks to the Library of Congress for providing such an elegant venue for the, uh, the conference here for two days. Uh, I have been uh, given a fairly restricted subject matter, which is current approaches to finding life beyond Earth and what it would mean if it happens. Uh, obviously, that's the entire subject of this symposium. So there's no way I can do this uh, in, in 20 minutes. So I'm just going to throw some ideas out at you, most of which you'll find offensive, uh, uninspiring and lacking in imagination, but that's merely to get you wound up very early in the morning. For those of us from California, it's especially early in the morning, so uh, if my comments are less than coherent, well, to begin with, that's not surprising, and secondly, uh, I hope you won't take offense at that. Anyhow, let me give you a, a brief overview of how we're looking for life in space. I will, in fact, concentrate on my day job, which is looking for the type of life we call intelligent, which means it can hold up its side of the conversation. I know Lori Marino thinks that certain uh, occupants of the ocean may be intelligent, but on the other hand, I've read their literature, and it's limited. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me move on on this. Does this baby work? Come in Earth. I'm hitting forward. Hello, guys in the back. There we go. OK. Uh, people ask, will occasionally ask me at cocktail parties, do I really think that there's life in space? I find this a very peculiar question, because if I didn't think that, I wouldn't keep the job I have. It's not that lucrative. But the reason I do, in the end, just boils down to very large numbers. This is the number of stars in the part of the universe we can see. The entire universe might conceivably be infinite, but in any case, it's much larger. That's a very big number, 10,000 billion billion. And what we know is that most of those have planets. Most of those stars have planets, 70, 80 percent, which is, in astronomy, the same as all. Right? Don't, don't have astronomers do your 1040. So that's a lot. And that means the implication directly is that if all of those planets are sterile and you're the only interesting thing happening in the cosmos, then you are a miracle. And you like to think that because your mom told you that ever since you were born. But on the other hand, that would be exceptional in the extreme. So the sort of middle of the road approach is to say, you're not a miracle, you're just another duck in a row of ducks. This is the number of planets in the Milky Way, roughly, plus or minus two. So that's a lot of planets. Okay? But the more interesting results are those that have come recently from the Kepler Space Telescope. One of the most successful, in my opinion, one of the most successful uh, missions that, that NASA has ever launched. Very simple idea. Bill Barucki at NASA Ames came up with this idea many decades ago, finally got funding. The idea here is to answer a very simple question. What fraction of stars out there that are like the sun, which is about 8% of all stars, what fraction of them have planets that could be like the Earth? Okay, and it's just beginning to answer that question. In the meanwhile, it has found thousands of planets. But finding planets like the Earth takes longer than finding other kinds of planets for technical reasons, which uh, we don't need to go into. But here are some preliminary results that were uh, uh, published by some people at the University of California at Berkeley uh, that are of interest. They say that something like one in five stars like the Sun will have a habitable Earth-sized planet. Habitable just means that water would neither freeze nor boil on the surface, okay? And that depends on things like atmospheres, which we know nothing about. But on the other hand, 22%, one in five, that's, that's a very high percentage. This number might be wrong by a factor of two, but a factor of two, once again, is not so interesting in astronomy, okay? In astronomy, pi is equal to one. Right? Okay, uh, but the far more common types of stars called red dwarfs, little small guys, and there are many more of those than there are stars like the sun, uh, somewhere between 16 and 53% was the, the conclusion of this paper, might have habitable planets, okay? All right, uh, red dwarf stars are, as I say, three quarters of all stars, right? In, in, in the realm of stars, nature is like in every other realm. There are more small guys than big guys. You go to Africa, everybody's interested in the megafauna, the big critters, but there are a lot more small critters than big critters. Same with stars. The, the bottom line of this is something like, again, one in five of all stars may have an, an analog to the Earth. That's a lot of 
habitable worlds, and indeed the number of Earths in our own galaxy might be on the order of 50 billion. So uh, for the 20, 30, 40 percent, as uh, Lamar Smith said, of Americans who think, well, maybe we're the smartest things or the only things alive in the universe, again, that makes you a miracle. And miracles have fairly low standing in science. Okay. Now, I'm just going to back up here and just briefly review our techniques for finding life beyond Earth because I think that despite all the, the, the stories you read in the papers and the science sections about, oh, well, here, here's water on Mars and here's this, here's that, so forth, all these stories, to my mind, break down into three stories, a kind of three-way horse race to find life in space. Hey, hey. And I think that each of these uh, horses has a, a priori more or less equal opportunity or likelihood, perhaps I should say, to cross the finish line in, say, the next 20 years. The big money is all in finding it nearby, on Mars, uh, some of the moons of the outer solar system. This is a photo of Mars, for those of you who weren't there this last weekend. And you can see those streaks at the bottom, the brown streaks. There are many interpretations of what those streaks may be, but they appear in the Martian summer. And one possible explanation is that that's frozen water that has melted in the Martian summer and is wetting the ground underneath it. And maybe the fastest way to find life in space is simply to send a rover to those streaks, dig up the dirt, look at it under a microscope, and maybe you see something. Uh, they may not be due to water, but anyhow, there's a lot of tantalizing evidence on Mars, everyone's favorite inhabited planet, but not just Mars. There are more than a half dozen other worlds just in our solar system that might have liquids that could spawn the kind of dirty chemistry we call life. All right, and uh, here's another obvious place, the Lakes of Titan. That's an artist's impression, but this is a real uh, photo made by radar of the surface of this moon of Saturn. You see these lakes. There's a dime in this photo for scale, but if you can't see that, those lakes are fairly large. The larger of them is about the size of Lake Erie. Okay, so these are big. And uh, Dirk in the audience here has suggested NASA ought to get back into the real business of exploration and do it with ships, as we used to do it 200, 300 years ago, and just send a robotic ship to one of these lakes and just, you know, trawl for uh, microbial life that might be in those lakes. Those lakes are not liquid water, of course. Daytime temperatures on Titan are mi minus 290 degrees. Those lakes are uh, methane and ethane, liquid methane and ethane. But still, that's hydrocarbon chemistry. So that's, that's one way to find life. And we will be doing experiments like that in the next 20 years. It all depends on funding, obviously. But that might be the way to find it. Another way to find it is to sniff it out. This is horse number two by simply looking at the light bouncing off the atmospheres of planets around other stars. These are the spectra of some planets you all know. On the top is Venus. The middle one is Earth. The bottom one is Mars. You see all three planets show ob, you know, obvious evidence of carbon dioxide, consequently the pre uh, presence of uh, SUVs. But you also see that for Earth, there is an absorption line of oxygen, right, O3 there, ozone, and, and also water vapor. And these, in the right combination, in the right combination, these together with CO2 would indicate the presence of biology, at least biology as we know it. So you could build a telescope, and in fact the James Webb Telescope will be able to do some of this, anyhow, for some nearby exoplanets. Just look at the light bouncing off the planet. It, the planet only has to be one pixel in the picture, but take some of that light, put it through a prism, and see if you see these absorption lines due to these elements. So that's sniffing out life. James Webb for some planets, anyhow, is expected to be able to find uh, these things, and maybe even the so-called red edge, a, a spectral feature in the infrared that would indicate chlorophyll. You know, I don't know what's there, Bob, but it looks like they have lettuce. So that would be, again, the time scale for this is, again, on the order of a few decades, and, and this may pay off. Now, I point out that these are where the major efforts are uh, on the assumption that actually these could find microbial life in the, in, the assumption there, which is probably not a bad one, is that microbial life is much more commonplace than more complex, say, intelligent life. I like to provoke people like Mary Wojtek and so forth, others, by saying that all the big money is going to look for stupid life. <laughs> but, because, again, the assumption being that stupid life is more common than intelligent life. And that's a, <laughs> that's a statement that you can verify by walking around your own neighborhoods. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I get immediate objection. I'm sure Mary will object that bacteria are not stupid. But on the other hand, you know, they don't do well on quiz shows. Okay. Um, the third uh, approach to finding life in space, of course, is to look for intelligent life. That's uh, kind of my day job these days. 
and that's to try and eavesdrop on signals the way Jodie Foster tried in the movie Contact and other ways. I'm going to give you some other ways to doing that. And that, I also think, I, I will spend some time on that. This is an idea that goes back actually to the 19th century, something Steve Dick knows about. There were proposals in the 1850s and the 1860s in Europe to try and signals our, signal our buddies on Mars, for example, with big lanterns or geometric forms in the landscape and stuff like that. That was actually a fairly legitimate approach, except for the fact that Mars probably doesn't have any life that would, <laughs> that you could, you know, would, would just respond to the signals. But in 1960, Frank Drake, who is still busy in this field, by the way, still active, Frank Drake used uh, this antenna. This is a photo I made a couple years ago, 300, when it's not even 300 miles, about 150, 200 miles from here, in Green Bank, West Virginia, uh, and pointed it in the direction of two nearby stars, hoping to eavesdrop on radio signals that the uh, aliens might be broadcasting. He didn't hear anything. He spent two weeks doing this. Actually, he did hear something, but it turned out to be the U.S. military, and that did not count as extraterrestrial intelligence. But the idea here is nonetheless demonstrably practical. This is a one-line calculation where you can show that even the kinds of transmitters we routinely build, you could send signals that could bridge the distances between the stars. So that's an interesting thing, and that suggests that no matter what they're doing, some of them may be producing this kind of radio noise, and we ought to be looking for it, and we are doing that. Now, let me just make a point here that I think is important, perhaps, to the philosophy of this, and that is, this is not science in the traditional sense. You know, when you're in middle school, they teach you that, well, with science, you have an hypothesis, and you design an experiment to try and falsify the hypothesis. If you can prove it wrong, then at least you know we can get rid of that hypothesis, and I'll come up with another one. Okay, but that's not what this is about. That's not what SETI is about, because there's no way you can prove they're not out there, right? Didn't hear them, Bob. I guess they're not out there. Well, it doesn't work. There, there are a million reasons that you might not hear them, even if they are out there. There's no way to prove they're not out there. The only hope is that the experiment could prove that they are out there. So this is not traditional science. This is exploration, and that point has already been made by Steve. Uh, exploration, and I, this is just an artist's rendition of finding Antarctica. For, for centuries, people sat around in the bars of Europe drinking a lot of beer and postulating the idea that maybe there's a big continent at the bottom of the world. And you could have all the beer you want, but in the end, you had to do the experiment. You had to send some ships down there and look. And that's what SETI is. It's, it's, it's exploration. It's exploration. No way to falsify it, but there is some chance that you may prove that your idea was correct. Okay, this, this is the Allen Telescope Array. This is what we use at the SETI Institute to look for signals. There are 42 antennas there. The idea was to build 350. I'm not going to say much more about the Allen Telescope Array. Most of you are familiar with the SETI Enterprise and what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, I'm trying to start a new plan there to look at red dwarf stars thousands of them, many thousands of them, because I really do think that uh, much of the life in the universe may be around these little runny guys. And in fact, red dwarf stars, they're small, they're small, but that means, and they're also not very bright, it sounds like some of my brothers, but on the other hand, by being, you know, kind of dim stars, it turns out that they last for a very long time. They don't have a whole lot of fuel because they're small, but they go through the fuel very slowly. It's like VW beetles, okay? So, uh, but why look at red dwarfs? Well, here's the reason. Three quarters of all stars are red dwarfs. So that means if you can only look at a finite sample, like 10,000 of them, on average, they're going to be square root of two closer to you than another kind of star, like sun-like stars. And closer is better because any signals would be stronger. So that's one thing. They're, t they're, they're uh, not the root two. They're t twice as close, actually. So that means four times the signal strength. Uh, a lot of them are suspected of having habitable worlds. And the other thing is, because of the fact that they go through their fuel so slowly, every red, store, uh, red dwarf ever born in, since the Big Bang is still burning today. None of them is more than a teenager. Okay, they're all still alive. They last for billions of years. And this is the one example I can think of where being older might be better. Because if you're older, then there's been more time for intelligence to develop and perhaps even very sophisticated intelligence. So these guys, on average, are billions of years older than sun-like stars. So that's the motivation for doing this. Let me give you just some other ideas about how you might do any and all of this. Uh, one thing to consider is, well, look, the universe has been around three times as long as the Earth. 
Okay, so there could be societies out there that are literally billions of years more advanced than we are. And maybe they self-destruct long before they get to that level, but you know, that's just the sunny kind of optimism you expect here in DC. I, you know, it does suggest though that there's some sort of distribution of ages of societies, and maybe the thing to do is develop strategies that could find the societies that are on the high end of that distribution, the ones that might be hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe even billions of years more advanced than our own current technological level, because they may make a lot of noise. They may be easier to find than trying to look for analogs of ourselves. Obviously, you're not going to find Neanderthals. They didn't build radio transmitters. But look for things that are very, very much more advanced. Okay. Now, one suggestion, a perennially popular one, is the one from Freeman Dyson. He said, look, if you're really an advanced society, you've got energy needs, what you do is you take apart, for example, we could take apart Neptune. Right? Nobody would complain. It's not big in your lives. Take apart Neptune and rebuild it as this giant shell around the sun, outside the Earth's orbit, obviously, and just collect all that starlight, turn it into energy, and beam it back to the Earth so everybody can power you know, their cell phones or whatever it is they need for their gusto-grabbing lifestyle. Uh, the thing is that the outside of the shell will be warm, waste heat. We assume everybody in the universe is subject to the second law of thermodynamics, so there's a lot of waste heat. Look for stars that have a lot of waste heat, a lot of infrared. Uh, there has been some effort in that regard. This is another idea. Here's a, a Cepheid variable star. They're very important in astronomy, but never mind that. They're big, bright stars that pulsate, just slowly getting brighter, and then two days later they get dimmer, and then they get brighter again, very regularly. They're kind of very slow metronomes on the sky. And Tony Z, who's a physicist at uh, UC Santa Cruz, has suggested, Santa Cruz or Santa Barbara? It may be Santa Barbara, actually. Anyhow, Tony Z has suggested, look, a really advanced society would recognize that these things can be seen from millions, hundreds of millions of light years away, these kinds of stars. They're so bright. Okay, Hubble, Hubble found them back uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century in nearby galaxies. And they may shoot high energy particles into these Cepheid variables, which would change their periods. And suddenly they would hiccup. And that would be a great signal that could be seen galaxies away that, hey, we're here. Aim your radio telescopes here, because we also have a low power radio signal that will send you the Encyclopedia Galactica or whatever it is we want to send you. Okay, so that's, that's something else you could look for. And that's easy to do. All you have to do is look up the periods of Cepheid variables, astronomers keep track of those. Easy. Another idea is just look for excess heat in an entire galaxy. Some civilization that's so advanced it's able to corral the energy reserves of its own galaxy. There's been some effort there too. Now let me just point out, uh, I occasionally consult for movies and one of the questions they always ask is, uh, <laughs> they ask what will the aliens look like and what weapons do they have? They always ask that. <laughs> What weapons do they have? I mean, it's crazy, right? It's like asking Julius Caesar, what do you think the US military will be using in the 21st century? Well, they have big spears and, you know. Uh, but the other thing that they ask is, what will they be like? And in the movies, they're always soft, squishy guys that are generally fairly ugly, don't wear any clothes, and have no sense of humor. Uh, that's all wrong. Time scale argument, and many people in the audience have, have uh, considered this. Look at what's happening in our own society. 1900, we invent radio, so suddenly we go on the air. We might be able to be found, okay? But in half a century after that, we already had computers, right? They took a whole room and so forth, but the basic architecture uh, uh, was already established, okay? And the assumption, and it may be wrong, but the assumption is that by the middle of this century, and maybe by the end of this century, we will have developed strong AI. We will have invented our successors, thinking machines. It's probably the most important thing that this generation is going to do. Okay, uh, I don't know whether we become their pets or, I don't know what happens, but that's not the subject of this discussion. The point is that going from inventing radio to inventing thinking machines is very short, a few centuries at most. Okay, so that means that the time during which you might find aliens that are biological is really quite short, right? That could be very short and that the dominant intelligence in the cosmos may be non-biological and that should affect the way we look for it. Unfortunately, I don't know how it affects it. So we're going to go from that to that. Uh, finally, what happens if we find a signal? This whole symposium's about that, so I will only offer my generally uninformed and soporific uh, comments on that. This is what Hollywood figures will happen if we find a signal. Everybody will get excited. There you see uh, well, a couple of guys in the movie The Arrival, which had the bad 
bad form to appear two weeks before Independence Day, so nobody went to see it. But it was actually an interesting film. Uh, and these guys are sitting around looking bored. They have a SETI experiment, and then suddenly they see a spike on an oscilloscope, get all excited, and as you can see, they're all excited here. Uh, and that's the Hollywood version. The actual version looks more like this. This is a photo I made in 1997. Uh, back at the SETI Institute, when we thought we had found a signal that might be it. Very interesting. I made this photo at 3.30 in the morning. I was so nervous I couldn't sit down, uh, and uh, so I just went around taking pictures. But we thought this might be it, and I kept waiting for somebody to call up, somebody from the Pentagon, from the White House, right? even the, the, the local mayor of Mountain View. Nobody called up. Nobody cared. And there's no policy of secrecy. People are immediately emailing all their friends, hey, we got this signal, nobody cared. Amazing, nobody cared. Until about 9.30 in the morning, I was half asleep at my desk and the phone rang and it was uh, Bill Broad, one of the science writers from the New York Times. And he said, what about that signal? He already knew about it in New York. They knew about it in New York. That's important. There's no policy of secrecy. Everybody knows right away. This is just a little graph I made for some paper where it just shows you our confidence in a signal as a function of time. But the, the only thing you need to take back from this is the fact that if you find a signal you think is real, it's going to be at least five or seven days before you believe it. Okay. The public figures that nobody will tell you. Just ask the public, what do you think will happen if you were to find intelli an intelligent signal from space? And they assume the government would cover it up because you couldn't handle the news. Right? Presumably you would say, that's it, Ralph. I'm going to riot in the streets. Uh, it's goofy. We know it's goofy from historical precedent. This is 100 years ago. 100 years ago, uh, you know... <laughs> Percival Lowell, a very accomplished guy, a degree from Harvard in mathematics and so forth. He thought that there was this vast hydraulic civilization on Mars. You all know that story. And this was just an article from the paper. But the public was not rioting in the streets about this. They just thought it was sort of interesting. These are 35 million miles away. There are Martians. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So how's your mom? You know, it was... Okay. If they do get in touch, I think that if we pick up a signal, there are really only two kinds of signals they could be. Category one, they recognize that they may be hundreds, thousands of light years away. Consequently, if they say, hi, look, we're the Klingons, would you like to join our book club, right? It might take a thousand years for that signal to reach us, another thousand years for our reply to get back to them, and then another thousand years for the response to that. You know, please repeat that, or whatever they say. So that is such a long time scale that, and they will be aware of that, they would, um, this is scenario one, they'll just send everything, send everything at once the way the Roman Empire has done to you. They sent everything. Take, took 2,000 years to get to you. It's interesting. You can't talk back, right? But they give you everything. That's category one. Category two uh, is slightly different. And that is this. And it derives from the fact that I don't think any of the aliens know we're here yet. They're, they're one third of the American population thinks the aliens are here, right? And they're here to protect us from ourselves or you know, environmental degradation and stuff like that. They don't know about any of that. We've only been broadcasting high-frequency, high-powered signals since the Second World War. That means, almost for sure, no society has heard us yet. So why are they sending all this stuff to us now? Why would they spend a lot of time directing a signal to us? This scenario two says they won't until they know we're here. So all they do is light up the sky for a fraction of a second, you know, every 10 minutes, every 10 hours, every 10 weeks, until they get our attention, we send something back and then they know we're here, and then they send the material. So it would be just a very simple one-bit ping, look at this spot on the sky. What would we know right away if we found a signal? There are very few things we would know right away. Our equipment is not designed to pick up messages. That requires a very short time constant. For technical reasons, we can't do that. We would know where they are. We would know what star system they are. Everybody would be trying to find planets around that star system. We would know how far away they are. That's just traditional astronomy. We would know a few astronomical facts about the length of the year, the length of the day, on the basis of the frequency change in the signal. Those are all very simple things. That's all we would know. We would not know whether their complexions were gray, green, or anything else. Uh, and just some salient points that I think are of interest in this. To begin with, the whole idea that we have this symposium to talk about what would happen if this exploration were to succeed, is in, it's not unprecedented, but it's very unusual. Right? I don't think uh, Chris Columbus sat around you know, having conferences. Well, suppose you trip across another continent on your way to Japan. You know, what would be the societal consequences of that? To begin with, there's no way they could know what the societal consequences were going to be, certainly not in the long term. But secondly, nobody did that. 
They didn't do it when they were looking for Antarctica. What will be the consequences of finding Antarctica? Right, so it's, it's highly peculiar, it seems to me, that we ask ourselves, this is exploration. What if we succeed? What does that mean to Joe Sixpack? Right? So that's, that's point one. Secondly, there's a highly emotional debate about if we were to find a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence, should we broadcast back or is that dangerous? I won't go into that except to say I think that's a silly argument, personally, because it's easy to demonstrate that any society that could, in fact, come here and ruin your whole day by incinerating Earth or whatever they're going to do, any society at that level would be able to pick up the signals we've been broadcasting in the space since the Second World War. They all already know. And, in, in fact, to restrict what we transmit into space would require that all subsequent generations of homo sapiens hide under a rock. I think that's a very, very bad idea. So uh, there you go, 10,000 generations of humans before us. Ours could be the first to know, and I'll bet you all a cup of coffee that'll happen. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Well, good morning. My name is Jason Steinhauer. I'm a program specialist at the John W. Kluge Center, and I'll uh, sort of be playing the role of uh, Master of Ceremonies MC for the next two days, sort of keeping the program moving and making sure that we're all uh, on schedule. Um, so again, just a quick uh, uh, thank you and really uh, extreme gratitude to Congressman Lamar Smith for his introductory remarks this morning and on a very busy morning uh, for Congress. And we're so appreciative of his time and our thanks to Stephen as well, to Mary Jane Deeb, our interim director, and, and to Dan, our colleague in the Kluge Center, um, for all their introductions this morning. And we will resume at 10.15 with our first panel. So thank you. Well, welcome back. Thank you all. So uh, a word of note about introductions and speaker bios. Our speakers are, um, as Dan mentioned this morning, distinguished speakers whose CVs uh, could take up an entire booklet, uh, each of them individually. And uh, so uh, for the sake of keeping the program moving and for ease for uh, you, our audience, and for those watching on the live stream, we do have bios of each of the speakers uh, in the program. And then, of course, um, all more information can be found about them on our website um, and uh, on the internet more broadly. Uh, we also have abstracts of all of the papers on our website as well. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, seeing the abstracts for all the papers, please visit our website. And we'll be tweeting our website throughout the day uh, on Twitter as well, so you can find it there. Um, so we're going to uh, begin with our first panel of the day, uh, Approaches, How Do We Frame the Problem of Discovery? The moderator for the panel is Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute, who you just heard. Uh, we also have Stephen Dick, who, as you heard earlier, is our Baruch S. Blumberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. Um, and I would also like to uh, mention and recognize that our first Astrobiology Chair, uh, Dr. David Grinspoon, is also here with us in the audience today. And of course, we're, uh, we're greatly appreciative um, for him being here. Um, we also have uh, Clement Vidal from uh, Free University of Brussels and Iris Fry from Technion Israel Institute of Technology. So again, full bios in the program, full abstracts on our website. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Stephen for the first paper of this panel. The way these panels will function each of the speakers will offer uh, remarks from the podium um, about their work, their research, and their insights. Uh, those will go for approximately 15 to 20 minutes each. And then following each of the papers, the moderator of the panel, in this case, Seth, uh, will lead a discussion uh, to bring out some of the intersections and perhaps contradictions uh, among the papers and to elicit discussion from you, the audience. Um, so we will have Q&A during uh, the group discussion. So if you have questions during the individual presentations, please write them down or uh, make notes on your program and hold them until the audience Q&A. And we will have one microphone circulating the room for audience Q&A, and Seth will work to uh, call on people. And we just remind you to please keep your questions concise. And always, uh, we prefer questions. Uh, if you do have a statement to make, please make that statement and then allow the panel to respond. So I think that covers everything. Once again, we are tweeting at Prepare to Discover and at Kluge Center. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Jason. Well, Seth is always a hard act to follow, but I'll try. Uh, uh, so 
part of my work here at the Library of Congress uh, as the Bloomberg Chair this year has been to write a book on the societal impact of discovering uh, life beyond Earth and how to prepare ourselves for that discovery. Um, let's see, so here's an outline of, uh, of what I'm working on. Uh, I'm about uh, three quarters of the way finished and I only got a month to go, so I've got a lot of, a lot of work to do yet. Uh, but my goal uh, for this meeting has been gather scholar, to gather scholars from around the world uh, to give their expert opinion on these matters because no one person can be an expert on the broad array of things that we're talking about here uh, over the next two days. But this interdisciplinarity is one of the great things about uh, astrobiology. So you'll see a parallel between the uh, program over the next two days and the book that I'm going to be talking about uh, here. Uh, so as I started to tackle this problem, the first question I had to ask is, how can you even approach such a uh, far out subject? Um, so I'm going to spend uh, the next 20 minutes talking only about this first part, the approaches. Uh, the critical issues and the potential impact we'll be talking about uh, over the next uh, two days. Um, so let's start with uh, this slide. Uh, the three approaches uh, that I would like to talk about are history, discovery, and analogy. Uh, in other words, uh, history, examining the reaction when people thought that life had been discovered, uh, discovery, uh, looking at what the nature of scientific discovery is, and analogy, using past events as guidelines. So let's start with history. I list here at least six cases where we thought we had discovered life in the past, and you can see them there, the moon hoax, canals of Mars, Lowell that you just heard about, uh, the War of the Worlds, pulsars, the Viking landers, the Mars rock. Uh, I could spend the entire lecture on any one of those, but uh, let me just say a few uh, words about each one. The moon hoax um, resulted from a series of six stories published serially in the New York Sun in August of 1835. And although, the, uh, according to those articles, the astronomer John Herschel, observing from South Africa, had observed this. If you can see that, <laughs> had actually observed that. Uh, this is from the Library of Congress Prints and uh, Photographs Division, uh, as it appeared in the New York Sun in 1835 large winged creatures. Oh, and if you can, could see the smaller ones, you'll see all manner of other creatures, but these creatures were seen gesticulating and therefore thought to be intelligent. Um, so that's pretty good for, for a telescope, right? Um, it, it mattered not that no telescope on Earth could have seen such a thing. Uh, it mattered not that the entire series was a product of a fevered imagination. Uh, what mattered was that the, uh, the upstart New York Sun uh, quickly became the most read newspaper in the world. Um, it turns out that uh, scholars now know that the author uh, Richard Adams Locke wrote the stories not as a hoax but as a satire. And what was he satirizing? He was satirizing the people who thought there were inhabitants everywhere, um, including one particular astronomer by the name of Thomas Dick, no relation as far as I know. <laughs> But uh, Thomas Dick had arrived at a figure of 21 trillion inhabitants in the solar system, not including the sun. Uh, so that was, this was supposed to be a satire about that, but of course people took it seriously. Um, so uh, we arrive at our first lesson from history. Uh, in the short term, the facts will particularly matter. Uh, what the media says will matter, uh, the perception and uh, not the reality. And that, that's also true of the second case, uh, the, uh, the War of the Worlds. Uh, Halloween Eve, uh, 1938, the famous Orson Welles broadcast of The War of the Worlds based on H.G. Wells' late 19th century novel. H.G. Uh, Wells had it taking place in London. Uh, Orson Welles relocated it to uh, New Jersey, uh, just uh, an hour south of New York City. And so this hour-long broadcast was presented as a series of news bulletins, uh, which many took to be real, despite warnings that it was just a, just a broadcast, a drama. Um, so it's the reaction to this event which makes it an uh, important part of radio history and a special uh, interest for us, for those of us who are studying the reaction to possible extraterrestrial contact in uh, its most extreme form of direct contact. Um, there's no doubt that the reaction was considerable with some thinking that uh, interplanetary conflict had actually begun with the uh, Martian invasion, uh, but subsequent studies have uh, shown uh, that it wasn't really the panic and the mass hysteria that it was portrayed to be. Um, in fact, the consensus now among scholars is that there was very little panic at all. So how did that idea get around? 
Well, according to the scholarship now, uh, there's no doubt that this was reported in newspapers as a panic, but it was, turns out it was based mostly on uh, anecdotal reports, and the scholars have concluded that these stories represented an irresistible attempt uh, by the print media to rebuke the new, the fledgling radio, uh, an upstart rival source of news and, and advertising, um, you know, making it seem untrustworthy and unreliable. Well, of course, in the process, they didn't do themselves any good either, but... but uh, uh, they perpetuated this myth, which has been very difficult to excise. In fact, uh, if you saw uh, the American experience on PBS just uh, last year, the 75th anniversary of this, they were still portraying it as a panic. So these things, once they get out uh, in the popular culture, are difficult to, uh, to uh, excise. So anyway, between the moon hoax and the, and the War of the Worlds, that's two strikes out for, for, the, for the media. But the third event is, is much more serious, and I want to say a bit more about that, and that's the announcement, and many of you will remember this almost 20 years ago now, of the Mars uh, rock, uh, and the claim that it contained very small, very tiny fossils called nanofossils. Um, uh, in other words, uh, proof that there had been past life on Mars. So, some of you remember, press conferences held at NASA headquarters down the street here. President Clinton spoke from the South Lawn of the White House. Vice President Gore convened a, a space summit. Here's one artifact from that. You can't see that in the back, but this is a letter from the White House inviting people to a, uh, this meeting in December of 1996 to discuss what the impact was going to be if this were true. Uh, congressional hearings were held. Uh, uh, the uh, numerous claims and counterclaims were made in the, in the press and in the scientific uh, journals, and uh, theologians opined on the meaning of it all, and of course the media went wild. Uh, again. Um, so entire books have been written on this episode and I can't uh, go over it all here, but suffice it to say that today we know that those Mars rocks were real, uh, which is astonishing enough. We do have Mars rocks here on Earth, but uh, the consensus is that those fossils are not real. Uh, and in the end, this case of the Mars rock offers the most robust example, I think, in the modern era of what might happen following a claim of life beyond Earth, even if it's only fossils. Some people say there's no, there'll be no reaction if we find microbes, but here is a case where they were fossils and people went wild. So I think there will be uh, quite a, a reaction. The uh, reaction of government institutions, the media, and the public will occur side by side with the uh, reaction among scientists who will subject the discovery to withering criticism. That's what scientists do. Uh, the media will uh, play an important role both in reporting and sensationalizing any claims. And of course, these days with the internet and other social media, the news of the discovery like this uh, would, split, would spread like wildfire in the 21st century. Uh, but as the Mars rock uh, demonstrates, the final conclusion will be far from immediate. It'll be uh, an extended process, which I uh, claim is the characteristic of all discoveries. And that brings me to my second approach, uh, discovery. So I want to say something about the nature of discovery in science in general. And for that, there's no better source than this great book called <laughs> Discovery and Classification in Astronomy, where I show uh, one of the main conclusions is that you don't just point your telescope and, oh, there it is, I made a great discovery. It's always an extended process over a period of weeks, uh, years, or even decades, where you have various stages of detection, interpretation, and understanding. Uh, there's no such thing as immediate discovery in astronomy. And I think there's no such thing as immediate discovery in, in any of science, really. Um, uh, so you have those three stages, and I think the same thing would be true, certainly, of a discovery of extraterrestrial life in whatever form. It's even possible we've already seen the signal, but we don't recognize it yet. It's possible we've made the detection, but don't interpret it properly, don't understand it. So. Um, Something will be detected, there'll be years or decades of interpretation, and full understanding will take even longer. And those are very important points if we're going to talk about uh, the impact of discovery. Another essential point while we're talking about discovery is that there are many discovery scenarios, and I just won't have time to go over these in detail. Uh, you may not even be able, well, here's the anatomy of discovery, <clears throat> detection, interpretation, and understanding as an extended process. Uh, discovery scenarios, of course, you can divide them into microbial discoveries and intelligent life discoveries. They could be discovered on Earth or off Earth, directly or indirectly. Most of the uh, effort these days is going to this bottom, uh, what I call encounter type three, where you have indirect extraterrestrial discovery. That's what we're looking for 
robotic exploration and that sort of thing. The same thing with intelligent life uh, discovery scenarios. You could be on the Earth, off the Earth, direct or indirect. Uh, the encounter type one there would be UFOs, uh, which some people uh, consider to be extraterrestrial um, uh, spaceships, that sort of thing. Uh, most of us don't. But uh, the, again, most of the effort is going to encounter type three there, uh, which is uh, what Seth talked about this morning. For example, uh, radio transmissions coming from another planet around another uh, star. So all of you science fiction fans will recognize that there are many uh, science fiction, you probably can't see this from the back either, but there are uh, lots of science fiction about what the impact might be if we make extraterrestrial contact under all of these uh, various uh, scenarios. Uh, there's very little written on uh, what the impact might be in science fiction uh, in, if you make a microbial discovery, although one of our speakers here, Dirk uh, schultz has, uh, has written uh, on uh, some science fiction on that. You'll be hearing from him this afternoon. So a lot more could be said about the nature of discovery and the discovery process, but the point here is that the reaction will be extended and will depend very much on the scenario, and this brings me to my third approach, analogy. So I know what you're thinking, analogy is a wishy-washy kind of an argument, why even consider that? What kind of a vague approach is that? Uh, so the first thing I want to do here is insist uh, that analogy is not just some wishy-washy form of reasoning used when you're desperate and lack any other form of argument. Uh, some of you know about Douglas Hofstadter, the Pulitzer Prize winner of Gertel Escher Bach, just written a very thick book. The subtitle is Analogy as the Fuel and Fire of Thinking. We use analogy all the time. Uh, and he says uh, analogy is, is anything but a little blip. It's, the, uh, it's, it's everything or very nearly everything uh, in his view in terms of cognition. We're using analogy all the time. Um, now, you have to be very careful. Uh, anthropologist uh, Catherine Denning has said the problem with analogies is that they are highly persuasive, um, inherently limited, and easily overextended. And that certainly is true. We have to use them very cautiously, and certainly we're, we cannot predict the future with them. But what you can do is lay out various scenarios and guidelines. And so uh, in my work, I, wanna, I take a look at some of these, what analogies uh, might be appropriate. Uh, but I also want to point out that astrobiologists themselves use analogy. In fact, astrobiology you couldn't exist as a discipline, I think, if you didn't use analogy. There are some of the analogies. Uh, the, the conditions on Earth compared to, uh, uh, to Mars and extremophiles and, and that sort of thing. So if scientists, if natural scientists can use analogy, then uh, social scientists can use analogy. And so that's what, we're, that's what we're doing here. But what kind of analogies? Well. Um, Supposing uh, we discover microbes, what might an analogy be? Um, I think the discovery of microbes represents a, uh, a revolution, would represent a revolution in, in biology, depending on the nature of the microbes found. So taking this as our starting point, you could ask what uh, discoveries in the history of biology might approximate such discoveries, uh, such uh, extraterrestrial discoveries. More specifically, if you assume that a discovery would change our view of life, what discoveries in biology have changed our views of life? Where there are, there are lots of those, uh, uh, Darwinian evolution by natural selection, uh, the role of DNA in genetics, uh, the discovery of extremophile microorganisms, and, and so on. But maybe there's nothing closer than the actual discovery of microbes. There was a time when we didn't know microbes existed on the Earth, and uh, so it was only in the late 17th century that uh, Robert Hooke and Anthony von Leeuwenhoek discovered this microbial world, so you can look at the reaction of what happened there. Um, it was a, there was a sensational for a while. This micrographia book was a bestseller, showing these little uh, microbes and other things through the early microscopes, but progress in microscopes was very slow. So it was only in the 19th century when we began to realize how important microbes were for, for health and all kinds of other things. Um, so today we know about the, the importance of microbes, but it took a long time to, uh, to figure that out. And the same thing may happen with uh, other microbes when, when we discover microbes uh, beyond the Earth. Another favorite analogy when you move on to extraterrestrial intelligence is what's called the culture contact analogy. Uh, in the case that we make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, either direct or indirect. And of course we have many examples of culture contacts 
on Earth, usually uh, with unhappy effects, and usually that's as far as it goes. Um, so here, here is a, uh, um, an image from the National Museum of the American Indian, just down the street here, which celebrates its 20th anniversary uh, this week, showing some of the uh, several dozen first contacts made between Europeans and the New World as part of the Western Age of Discovery. Uh, one particular example is uh, Cortez and the Aztecs uh, in Mexico in 1519, which you always hear about. Uh, and uh, here is an image from, you really need to go during lunchtime upstairs, one flight up here, and see this from the Jay Kislak collection of the uh, history and cultures of the early Americas. These are 17th century paintings uh, of that first contact. And if you can see this, uh, the first contact was not so bad, but it very quickly, as we all know, devolved into this, the, uh, the um, destruction of Tenochtitlan um, by, the, uh, by, uh, by Cortez and, and the, uh, his troops. Uh, by the way, while you're looking at these upstairs, you should also see the Valse Mueller map, the first map, the 1507 map with the word America on it for the first time. There are some great exhibits just upstairs here. Um, anyway, this example is just, this is just one example, so it's very difficult, to, very dangerous to draw conclusions from a sample of one. And in fact, outside the Western tradition, there are other models for contact, uh, such as this one with the, uh, the Chinese treasure fleet in the uh, 15th century. Um, uh, in fact, uh, these seven trips, seven voyages in, in the 15th century resulted not in destruction of uh, of cultures, but in, in the new ideas, and uh, although they did exact some tribute, but the, uh, the uh, uh, scholarship these days shows that these were much more moderate culture contacts than the ones before. Uh, this is amazing. You could easily get sucked into this. If you can see the image there, the size of the Chinese ships compared to Columbus's ship down there, extremely large. Uh, so these were not uh, necessarily for, uh, it's not the kind of ship you would uh, use for, uh, for trying to uh, attack other civilizations. Uh, uh, the uh, Columbus's ships, which were these small caravels, were much better for exploration, but were also used for, for destruction, as we just, as we just saw. Uh, now, one of the most trenchant criticisms of this is that uh, you're dealing with the same species, Homo sapiens. So what kind of an analogy is that? And that's a good criticism. Uh, so one other possible analogy is uh, the analogy of modern Homo sapiens with Neanderthals, because we know that Neanderthals overlapped with Homo sapiens over a period of time. How do we know that? Well, 3% of the genome of most of us is Neanderthal, so we know there was interaction there. Unfortunately, we don't know much else about that interaction, but uh, one anthropologist wrote that this culture contact would be a particularly good analogy because Neanderthals had a completely uh, different sensibility uh, than we had as Homo sapiens. So that may be closer to the kind of interaction we would have if there were actual culture contacts. So what are the lessons learned from uh, culture contacts? Um, it's not that a society, a more advanced society, would necessarily destroy a more inferior one, uh, as indicated both by the Chinese case and also by uh, the case of Jesuits among the American uh, native uh, Indian tribes. Um, Though the destruction, of course, was real in some of these culture contacts, uh, we can't conclude that, uh, that, that even if it's physical contact, that destruction would be the outcome. I think more illuminating are the communication and the cultural interactions, which include both positive and negative effects. Uh, and if you take any one um, interaction as an exemplar, almost any lesson could be learned, but it's far better to learn from the entire set of experiences, or better yet, to learn the collective lessons common to all of those contact uh, experiences. Uh, so um, I think the determination of characteristics common to all culture contacts is a respectable research program that could pay uh, dividends. So uh, just a couple more analogies. Supposing it's a kind of analogy that, or kind of uh, process that Seth was talking about this morning where you have a uh, transmission. Um, this is what I call the decipherment translation uh, analogy. Uh, one, one particularly good one, I think, is the transmission of Greek knowledge to the Latin West by way of the Arabs in the 11th and 12th centuries. 
But of course, the problem there is that we already knew the languages, uh, and people have pointed out that it may be more like the decipherment of the Mayan glyphs or the Egyptian, or Egyptian hieroglyphics. Or if you want to bring it more into the modern world, uh, and if you're getting an information flow from this, the Gal Encyclopedia Galactica that Seth mentioned, then you might look at analogies such as Gutenberg, the printing press, or even the internet. I mean, if you ask, there you see how difficult it is to, to try and decide what the impact is going to be. What's the impact of the internet been on modern culture? Very complicated process, right? Okay. So uh, finally, uh, I would say there's uh, the worldview analogy. Um, even if an extraterrestrial message is not discovered, even if we have a um, discovery of microbial life, I think our worldview might change over time. And of course, there's a, a lot of uh, literature in how worldviews have changed in the wake of scientific events like the Copernican uh, theory, the Darwinian theory, and the, even the current Hubble shapley theory of the universe, or even seeing the imagery from the Hubble Space Telescope. What effect does that have on culture? So. Uh, I claim that, uh, I want to claim that analogy uh, can be useful, but it must not be so general as to be meaningless, nor so specific as to be misleading. The middle, what I call the Goldilocks ground, is where the analogies may serve as useful guideposts, generating scenarios and setting limits. So, uh, just to some concluding points there, to summarize, uh, the lessons of history are, of course, difficult to learn and ambiguous. History, discovery, and analogy, however, offer a grounding in experience. Uh, we can't make predictions. We're only looking at scenarios and guidelines. Analogy can be as powerful in history as it is in science. Uh, the discovery of extraterrestrial life might be unique. It might well be uh, unique, and there really is no analogy. But if you say that, then, well, we just throw up your hands and you can't even talk about it. And finally, even if no life is found, uh, these are good uh, thought experience. Uh, experiments. So I've only, uh, I think my time is, is well up, uh, uh, I've uh, only summarized the very top level of these uh, arguments and this is only just the first little section of my book, but we can discuss more about this uh, in the round table at the end. Thanks. So, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Um, today I will talk about the idea of, uh, of silent impact, the worldview's significance of discovering non-communicative extraterrestrials. So, of course, we are used to some pictures of extraterrestrials, um, which are very anthropomorphic, but what if they don't look like us, and what if when dis we discover extraterrestrials there is no communication? How would it impact our worldviews to find non-communicative extraterrestrials? These are the subjects I would like to address here. Um, I will first um, speak about the no communication argument, um, then elaborate uh, on the idea that the discovery will be slow like previous great scientific discoveries. And then I will explore some uh, concepts to, um, to um, understand the worldview impact. So this is a, an important slide here. It shows um, the uh, technic technological progress um, through time. So it's a, an argument that Seth also made uh, earlier, it's, is that um, uh, we are somewhere in the middle uh, in, a, in a phase transition between technical impotence and technical omnipotence. So if we apply, uh, if we take this idea seriously, um, and we assume that our civilization is typical, then it means that other civilizations will be in the same uh, situation. So it means that either we will find primitive life or very advanced life, which uses energy from stars, for example but we are very unlikely to find uh, siblings, to find civilizations at our level. So strangely enough, uh, the core of this thinking is the principle of mediocrity, 
Um, we have well understood it for our space. We know that the center, the, the Earth is not the center of the universe, neither is the sun, neither is our galaxy or even the clusters of galaxies are uh, at the center somehow. But um, we need also to apply this principle of mediocrity to our evolutionary uh, time. Um, there are, there are other arguments which suggest that there will be no communication. There could be ethical barriers to communication, such as a non-interference directive in Star Trek, where advanced civilizations are not allowed to, to uh, contact uh, less advanced ones. There might be motivational barriers. Uh, for example, why don't we spend time uh, whispering to bacteria or plants that E equals MC squared? Uh, it doesn't even make sense to try. So there are, um, as Thess also mentioned, there are other ways to, to look for non-communicative extraterrestrials. Uh, for example, Dyson spheres or signs of um, stellar engineering or trying to find uh, artifacts. Um, but then, of course, if we don't have uh, communication, we have the issue of how do we prove it? How do we prove that we have found extraterrestrials if we can't communicate with them? Um, I would like to say that it's possible to, to have a proof, even if it's less direct, if we are able to make predictions out of the assumption that we have discovered extraterrestrials. So how long will it take to establish a proof um, of non-communicative extraterrestrials, it will likely be, be slow. And uh, there will be resistances, of course, which are healthy, like the scientific resistances. Of course, skepticism will be at its highest. Um, maybe even more if uh, the suggestion is already in our data, like if today we reopen the case of uh, Martian meteorites, uh, there will be resistances because we we uh, think we have understood it. There are some recent trends in astrobiology, um, such as genomic SETI that uh, Paul Davis and others before ha had proposed, uh, is to look for messages in the DNA. And um, also uh, there is my own um, star error hypothesis, which is a speculation about um, binary star systems, which could be extraterrestrial life. So again, why would we reinterpret existing data? We need to find predictions. So yes, the history supports a slow discovery. Um, Morrison uh, said that the, the discovery of extraterrestrials will be like agriculture, not like America. It will be a s slow and long process. And uh, previous uh, claims were also very ambiguous. Um, for a long time, like the, the, the canals of Lowell, we, we love today when we see the pictures, but it was ambiguous during 20 to 70 years. It's, it's easy to laugh afterwards. Um, and also the controversial Martian meteorites, which took time. So now uh, I go to the third part of my talk, which is the worldview impact. Um, I would like to propose a to suggest a model with nine dimensions of impact and which I will illustrate with three silent impact scenarios. And then I will uh, examine some benefits and danger of the biological worldview, so the idea that the universe is full of life. So if you start from the top and clockwise, the dim dimensions I, I propose are, first, the first two are the distance and complexity. Um, and Harrison, um, Albert Harrison argued that these are the two most important parameters. I, I largely agree. If we find um, uh, on Earth something very complex, it's, it's a huge, it has a huge impact. Whereas if we find something very simple and very far away, the impact will be much lower. But there are also other factors that we can uh, propose, such as the size. If um, the size is very different from our, uh, our own scale. Either if, if the extraterrestrials are very small that we can't see them, or very big, in, in both ca these cases it will be scary. The living state also is a very important parameter, if it's alive or if it's a fossil. Uh, the influence on us, 
Um, if uh, the, we would find out that extraterrestrials had an influence on our past, such as in, uh, in scenarios such as uh, directed panspermia, um, our knowledge of them also is a very important factor for, for the impact. If we know everything about them or if we know almost nothing, the less we know, of course, the more uh, distressing it could be. Um, there is also the parameter of their knowledge of us. If they know everything about us and we know nothing about, about them, it's, it's of course, uh, uh, it has, a, of course, a great impact. Their intent, if they are benevolent, malevolent, and their communicative intent, if they want to communicate or not, or, or if they communicate at all. So I, I would like to illustrate this with three silent impact scenarios. The first is, uh, these are ima well, more or less imaginative, um, speculative. Uh, the first is if we would find an extinct primitive biosphere. The second, if we would um, have proof that uh, viruses are actually the result, the result of a directed panspermia, that they would have been sent by an advanced civilization and an intermediate impact, um, the Starivar hypothesis, where, um, so, uh, where we re reinterpret some binary star systems as um, advanced civilizations. And so just as a note, if you, if you um, take uh, Eric Chesson's complexity metric, there is an eight order of magnitude complexity between uh, the energy which arrives on Earth and uh, the, the energy used by putative uh, star rivers. So uh, here you see, uh, now we can start to, to draw the uh, spider uh, chart. Um, so in the case of star rivers, the complexity will be high, their size will be big, uh, they will be living. We don't know their influence on us. We have limited knowledge because we have some knowledge about binary astrophysics, but not in this slide, of course. We don't know what they know about us. We don't know their intent. Uh, the communicative intent, uh, it could be that, uh, I speculate in, uh, in, my, in, my, in my work that some uh, X-ray or millisecond pulsars might be beacons or artificial navigation systems, but it's a big speculation. And the distance is not too far away, it's uh, in our galaxy. So the impact, you see uh, how it will look like. So now the, the least impactful is a primitive biosphere. So you see that now the, the impact is a rather small circle. And uh, the most, I would say one of the most impactful would be uh, viruses as extraterrestrials. The, the distance would be very near, it will be here on Earth. The complexity of viruses is actually pretty high. We can't see them. They are alive, although we can discuss a bit on this. Um, they influence a lot of evolution. Um, our knowledge of them, well, it's reasonable but not complete. Um, and if we imagine that uh, the intelligent civilization had uh, a great knowledge of us, um, and if we imagine furthermore that uh, there is a malevolent intent with spreading viruses, well, then you see that the impact um, would be very high. So my point with these examples is that uh, the impact will definitely uh, depend on which scenario happens. So you need to reimagine all possible configuration of this spider diagram uh, and see what impact it would have on society. So now I turn to the biological worldview and the, the benefits for science. Uh, I would say the main benefit is to universalize knowledge. So we all scientists envy the, the physicists who have a universal body of knowledge. Their theories work as well here on Earth and very far away. Uh, but with the astrobiological enterprise, we hope to universalize all other domains of knowledge, such as biology, language, sociology, economy, ethics, law, aesthetics, theology, culture, eschatology. And, um, and so this biological worldview forces us to think in universal terms because, because each time we ask, well, but what would be uh, beautiful for an alien, for example? 
And so we are forced to, to, to step out of anthropocentrism. I would like to, to make uh, an argument that um, as we develop astrobiology, um, uh, we will integrate more our knowledge and we will also, if you think about response protocols, if we uh, have a, a message from space, then we really need to coordinate as a whole, as a planet. Uh, so it contributes to make uh, a, a kind of planetary identity. And the, it works also the other way around. It's um, because we, we are getting more and more globalized that with the internet, with uh, the connections of, uh, at a planetary scale, we are kind of forming a more and more planetary identity. And this little guy on the left would want to, to know if there are others like him. So it will stimulate also astrobiology. But what if really we are alone? There is no really an academic danger because we still universalize our knowledge and that's something good, that's something all theoreticians want to do. Uh, is there an economic danger? Um, well, we can ask the, the question the other way around. What is the cost of not searching if we then afterwards are surprised? And in the process, we also make new discoveries and new transferable technologies. Um, there, is, there are some psychological dangers, such as what psychologists call anchoring. Just because we started to invest in it, we will want to, to continue to continue like when you wait for the bus, five minutes is still not coming, you wait and another five minutes and you don't know when to change your decision. Some critics also have said that it's a quasi-religious undertaking. Um, I think these criticisms are valid, but in the end, the issue is observational. So uh, if we want to try to prove that we are alone, although it might be impossible, as Seth uh, said, we still need to explore. And also, if we go back to, to, to life on Earth, it means that we, we, we need to make, if we are really alone in the universe, it would be amazing, and then we would need to take a maximum care of life here. And I would even argue that we have a duty of colonization, that to spread life elsewhere. So my conclusion uh, here in this aspect is that the astrobiological journey is more important than the destination that by just searching, we learn so much, and there is so much to learn, that maybe in the end, we'll learn more during the process than after the, the real discovery. So in conclusion, um, I suggest that the impact will be silent in three different ways. First, because we are most likely to find silent extraterrestrials, either microbiolife or very advanced uh, stellar civilizations. Then um, the the silence could be also in the news if the, if the discovery is a slow discovery. There will be debate, yes, there has been life, no, there, no, it's not life. There will be a scientific debate during 20, 30 years and people will um, get bored and, uh, and so the, the news might, might come without a hitch at the end. But it's, it's good news for our psychology and worldviews which need time to adapt, to, to digest such news. And also, uh, I argue that it's, um, it's desirable to, to aim at a silent absorption by preparing for a wide range of possible scenarios of impact and also by developing a more cosmic culture. Thank you for your attention. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm very happy to be here, and I wish to thank Steve for inviting me to participate in this important symposium. Um, I will devote my short talk to the philosophy of astrobiology, in particular to its two philosophical presuppositions, the Copernican and Darwinian assumption. So, let me see. 
Does astrobiology has a philosophy? Yes, yes it does. Every scientific discipline approaches its subject matter guided by philosophical presuppositions. We do not experience nature as a clean slate, as a tabula rasa. Rather, we rely on general conceptions, conceptions of nature constructed gradually by past experience and shaped also by social and cultural factors. I would like to give two prime examples of such presuppositions. First, natural laws apply universally. And second, natural processes depend on natural causes and not on the interve intervention of a supernatural deity. The philosophical and the empirical theoretical elements of science are epistemologically distinct. Unlike theoretical empirical hypothesis, philosophical presuppositions make universe, universal claims that cannot be observed or tested. Yet, these two elements, the philosophical and the empirical theoretical, are not isolated from each other and interact along a historical timeline. Philosophical conceptions give direction to theoretical and empirical study and are being reinforced by the results of such study. This interaction during the last few centuries led to the rise of the evolutionary naturalistic worldview. Strongly established by now, this worldview underlies the natural sciences. It also validates the study of the origin of life and more generally astrobiology. So let us now uh, continue to the two philosophical presuppositions of astrobiology. <clears throat> we don't have an answer yet to the questions whether extraterrestrial life exists, microbial, multicellular, or intelligent. We also don't have an answer yet what was the specific mechanism of the origin of life on Earth. Research of these two major questions presupposes first the Copernican assumption, which says that Earth is not uniquely chosen for life. Habitable conditions might exist elsewhere. And the Darwinian assumption, Life emerged here by an evolutionary process and might do so also elsewhere. Obviously, these two presuppositions grew historically. As to the historical development of towards Copernicanism, which I called, I called from Copernicus to Copernicanism. <clears throat> this historical development is very well studied and documented, mainly due to the work of Stephen and Michael Crow and a few other historians of science. They deeply researched the historical debate on the plurality of world, the interaction between science and philosophy on, on these issues. And uh, we know from this work that Copernicanism was well established toward the end of the 18th century. However, 
Establishing Copernicanism was a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the future scientific study of extraterrestrial life. Crucially, this scientific study depended on overcoming traditional teleolog teleological theological reasoning. It was due to the rise of the Darwinian assumption that this traditional reasoning was eventually abandoned. Unlike the historical development of Copernicanism, the development of the Darwinian presupposition and its influence on our subject <clears throat> were less straightforward, less direct. The belief that the universe is populated by intelligent creatures, what was called uh, the belief in pluralism, was justified by teleological and theological reasoning up to the 19th century. The notion was that God populated the universe to further various purposes. Also, anti-pluralism, the rejection of the pluralistic belief, was justified by theological anthropo anthropocentrism and the rejection of materialistic evolution up to the 19th century. William Ewell, the renowned philosopher and scientist of the 19th century, said that man was divinely placed on earth and did not grow out of monkey. Overcoming Sorry. We are now at the bottom of the slide. Overcoming design and teleology was a complex and difficult process. A stark example of this difficulty and, and complexity is of the great evolutionist Alfred Russell Wallace, who at the beginning of the 20th century still argued that life and mind were produced uniquely on Earth by a superior intelligence. It is also remarkable that at the turn of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, <clears throat> Darwinism was still seen to be on its deathbed, especially for the lack of a viable theory of heredity. Many biologists at the time suggested purposeful evolutionary mechanisms. Natural selection was finally accepted as the major mechanism of evolution only in the 1930s to the 1940s. Also importantly, <clears throat> rejecting anthropocentrism dependent on the notion established by Darwinism that the human species evolved as a branch on the tree of life like other species. So the contribution of Darwinism to the study of extraterrestrial life was twofold. Philosophically, by establishing evolutionary processes as naturalistic, and by undermining teleology and anthropocentrism. And scientifically, by applic the application of the mechanism of evolution in a primitive form to the emergence of life itself. Current study of the emergence of life is guided by the notion that chemical prebiotic structures could enable primitive reproduction, variation, and selection. 
leading to the first organized living systems. This is a very important point and I, I hope to be able to devote a few words to it in our panel discussion. Yet there are however, uh, current, current skeptics uh, who um, consider skeptically the empirical aspects of both Copernicanism and Darwinism. In 2000, a book <coughs> sorry, called Rare Earth was published by paleontologist Peter Ward and astronomer Donald Brownlee, who argued that the evolution of multicellular, especially intelligent life, unlike microbial life on other planets, is extremely improbable. Their case was based on the examination of physical factors determining the habitability of planets, and second, on the many improbabilities involved in the evolution of complex life. Critics of the rare earth hypothesis pointed out, and I quote uh, uh, the renowned uh, geoscientist um, Casting, that uh, James Casting, that the author referring to the rare earth uh, authors, consistently take the most negative position on each issue. And as Casting said, alternative positions often are equally viable. Maybe we'll have time in our discussion to try and figure out why Ward and Brownlee chose to take the most negative option in each case. <clears throat> Yet, I would like to point out that despite its criticism, <clears throat> the rare earth hypothesis does assume the Copernican Darwinian philosophical framework and presents an empirical challenge to it. So this thesis, the rare earth thesis, is not a philosophical rival of astrobiology. As an indication to that, I would like to quote uh, um, things that Peter Ward said in an interview in 2013. He was saying after some discovery of extrasolar planet, uh, which is the, the size of Earth. And he said that their hypothesis, the rare Earth hypothesis, will be tested, he said, maybe with funding within 50 years, when Earth-like planets will be actually imaged and analyzed spectroscopically. So, as I said, he offers his thesis as an empirical challenge to Copernicanism and Darwinism. On the other hand, the thesis of the privileged planet is another case altogether. <clears throat> the privileged planet, how our place in the cosmos is designed for discovery, was published in 2004 by astronomer Guillermo Gonzalez and philosopher Jay Richards, both intelligent design advocates. They make two claims. First, the rare earth argument based on similar scientific data to the data of Ward and Brownlee. And second, they contend that the earth is among the best places in the universe to make a wide range of scientific discoveries in geology, astronomy, cosmology, etc. According to Gonzalez and Richards, this cannot be accidental. 
For example, the Earth and Moon harmoniously produce the best solar eclipses just where there are observers to see them. <clears throat> These and other examples, they believe, demonstrate purposeful design for life and scientific discovery. Gonzalez and Richards are disappointed with the rare earthers. They, Ward and Brownlee, obviously challenge the letter of the Copernican principle, but they don't challenge its spirit. Instead of suggesting that Earth is part of some cosmic design, they argue that these conditions are still nothing more than an unintended fluke. So uh, having compared these two theses, the one scientific, the other anything but, <clears throat> I would like to say uh, just a few words on the scientific status of astrobiology. <clears throat> the historical development of the naturalistic worldview depended on the interplay between empirical discoveries and philosophical guiding assumptions. The response of the scientific community to the publication of the theory of evolution in 1859, and the response today attest to these dynamics and to the current strong status of this worldview among scientists. <clears throat> to those who are skeptical about astrobiology, they describe it as a science without a subject matter. Let me say, skepticism toward the scientific status of the fields of astrobiology and the origin of life, I believe reflects a misunderstanding of the nature of science. As evident from the history of science, many unknowns became later fully known. Such is the case with extrasolar planets, and such might be the case with the mechanism of the origin of life and with finding life elsewhere. Moreover, as argued here, the scientific validity of a field is not determined exclusively by its empirical results but also by its philosophical underpinning established by the record of science. And let me just end with a few words on epistemological distinctions. Unlike empirical hypotheses, as I said, philosophical assumptions making universal claims cannot be tested. This is true of both naturalistic and supernaturalistic claims. Yet, the two are not equivalent knowledge-wise or epistemologically. Because of their natural content, specific hypotheses derived from Copernican and Darwinian assumptions can be examined and can challenge or support the general framework. Supernatural claims, on the other hand, present a scientific dead end. Thank you very much. Okay, well, for the next hour, we're going to turn this into an interactive discussion. Uh, the panel, the, the title of this is uh, How Do We Frame the Problem of Discovery? Now, you've heard uh, some commentary by the three speakers, and since there has not been one of these panels up here so far in this conference, we are free to uh, set the parameters of how they're going to be, and undoubtedly we'll do so incorrectly. But uh, 
I would like first just to give the opportunity to each of the speakers if they wanted to say something further, either commenting on something other people have said or simply to restate their position on this topic for a minute. We'll do that, and then after that, they'll start discussing. And very shortly thereafter, I want to open it up to the, uh, to the audience so that you can grill these people like cheese sandwiches and find <coughs> out you know, the answers to questions that are truly bothering you. I, I would ask that this not be a situation where you, like I am just now doing, uh, speak endlessly. Uh, you know, don't pontificate, although Brother Guy may object to that. Uh, <laughs> nothing against pontification in general, but not up here. Okay, and, and so we can get in as many questions from the audience as possible. Uh, Clement, did you want to say something for no, a minute? No, 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 no. You can. I can. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Iris? Yeah, I would just like to say a few words that, am I heard? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That I didn't have a chance to um, speak about during my lecture, which was indeed on the philosophy of astrobiology. Uh, more relevant to our subject, uh, I, and, and in coherence with what you said about the biological worldview, I think that indeed astro astrobiology has a very strong uh, role in enlightening the public. Um, first of all, I think that taking into account the situation that our world, our humanity on this planet is right now, the fact that astrobiology treats us as a general we, not as a nations, ethnic tribes, different religions, but as a common we, I think is a very enlightening project of astrobiology. Uh, I think that this came out here that astrobiology has indeed a very strong lesson against anthropocentrism. And the fact that, the, the fact that we are looking now for microbes and our realization that microbes and we humans are part of the same tree of evolution is very important. So not only microbes are not stupid, microbes are also very complex. So when people speak about, people speak about microbe life, microbial life, complex life, microbes are extremely complex. So I think that teaching the public to respect all creatures, big and small, is very important. And another lesson which is very important, just in, some, in a maybe contradictory way, because we still don't have an answer to our quest, I think that it's a very important lesson indeed on the nature of science, that science is not a, a body of definite, certain statement. That science has to do, again, not only with discovery and exploration, but with skepticism, with doubts, with uncertainties. And I think that all these lessons are very, very crucial to astrobiology. Steve? Well, I would just reinforce what you said about the importance of microbes. I think we downplay microbes at our uh, peril um, because, uh, well, Lynn Margulis is the famous person who really emphasized the importance of microbes. You all know that thousands of species of microbes, you know, we have on, uh, just on our body or uh, inside of us. Uh, they're essential to, uh, to our life. And um, so uh, when we find, extra, if we do find extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, they probably will have microbes also. <laughs> Uh, and I think uh, you have to remember that microbes have played a very important role. I didn't talk much about this, but the Columbian Exchange, of course, uh, the, these cultures that I mentioned in terms of culture contact, uh, most of the damage was not done by, uh, by the Spaniards. The damage was done by the microbes of uh, the diseases that were transmitted. So uh, when you're talking about extraterrestrial life, it's very important to uh, consider uh, the importance of microbes, both in the positive and the negative. Um, uh, I'd be interested in uh, questions from the audience uh, from the point of view of my presentation about uh, whether or not uh, 
Do you think lessons really can be learned from history? That's a contentious thing in itself. Uh, lots of people learn lots of lessons, and it usually depends on what your point of view is, uh, especially if you're talking about politics. Uh, or, and also, uh, when uh, you know, just how useful is analogy? You, analogy, as I emphasize, can go overboard, but uh, if you use it cautiously, I think it, it can be useful. But there may be uh, other points of view on that. Command a second chance. No. Uh, yes. Well, I can comment on uh, analogy. Um, I, I mostly agree with the cognitive scientists who say that a lot of cognition comes from analogy. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it can be more, more useful than, than, uh, than, you, than you say, that we can really try to, to map the similarities between the, the two domains of knowledge mm -hmm. and see what is missing in one, what is in, in one network of uh, relations and, and the other network. And if there is something missing, then it makes uh, it generate, it's a heuristic to generate hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, maybe since it's like this in this network of relations, maybe it's also like that in this other network. So it, it's, it's a powerful way also to generate right. new hypotheses. Yeah, I didn't emphasize that, but uh, analogy is a very hot topic in philosophy of science and cognitive science, and there are these methods for mapping have been laid out. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you could certainly go into it in more detail than I did. Yeah. All right, well, then I'm going to throw out uh, maybe a question here just to get you guys started. Uh, most of the discussion in terms of framing how we deal with the possible discovery of extraterrestrial life, and by the way, although this audience is fairly ample in terms of number, the number of microbes in the room is actually considerably more, <laughs> and I hope that they will ask questions. Um, we've been discussing with the immediate reaction to the discovery of life elsewhere. Almost everything that has been said has been that. And it would be like, I don't know, the court in Spain saying, well, in case Chris actually discovers new lands, not that he ever figured he had, uh, you know, here's how we're going to handle this. This is what we're going to tell the uh, Spanish press and whatever. Not that there was a press, but, okay? And, and yet, the real important developments were the ones that came much more slowly, that took centuries, actually, to unravel. And does anybody want to say anything about the long-term long effect of finding life beyond Earth? Well, just that I, I think you're right, it will be long term. If you look at these, if you consider the biological universe, the idea that the universe is full of life as a kind of a worldview, and you use as an analogy the Copernican or Darwinian or, or the Hubble uh, worldviews that we've gone through, the uh, effects I think are long term. I mean, uh, you know, it took a century before most people even believed Copernicus, and it took much longer after that to have the impact that, uh, although you do see some um, um, fairly immediate impact, you know, the, the center will not hold, all coherence is lost, John Donne and all of this, uh, in the, already in the 17th uh, century, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, but I do think uh, that it will be uh, long term and that we can get a handle on some of that from, by using uh, these analogies that I mentioned. Clement mentioned the fact that it might be a non-communicative uh, encounter, if we're talking about intelligence, or if it's microbes, the microbes may not say anything. Okay, <laughs> I mean, you just find some gases in the atmosphere of a planet, there's not, you know. It tells you something, but not very much. Uh, clearly, I would think that the long-term reaction would depend a little bit on whether you, in fact, gain more information. In the case of, obviously, an intelligence, you know, is there a message that you could pick up? Could you ever understand that message? Uh, there's some discussion of that coming up here. That would change things. If, if the uh, Native Americans had met the Spaniards and they never understood anything about them, that would have been a different scenario or not. Yeah, I'd say totally different. Uh, I mean, it's one, it's one scenario if you get a, what we call a dial tone in the business, where you just, uh, you, know, you, you know that it's intelligent, but that's all you know. Uh, it's quite something else if you can decipher the information. It's quite something else, again, if you, depending on what they say. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, it very much depends on the scenario, I think. Does anybody want to comment on the, the, the fact that there is not, to my knowledge, any organization either in the governments of individual nations or at the UN or anything, that is actually thinking about this. And the public believes that there is. The public, at least in my experience, they will say, you know very well that the military is prepared in case we <laughs> discover extraterrestrial life, assuming, presumably, that it's hostile, right? Well, to my knowledge, the military is not prepared for that. They, they don't give this a whole, whole, whole heck of a lot of thought. But maybe some, some organization should be set up, maybe a small office at the UN. Well, the only thing I know about are the SETI, the SETI protocols, which are well known in the business, uh, which uh, 
come under the, uh, were devised under the International Academy of Astronautics. Uh, and uh, basically they say, uh, f first confirm and then tell everybody. Uh, it would be a good idea to confirm your observation before you tell everybody. But whether that will actually happen or not uh, is, you know, it's not enforceable. And you gave an example that, <laughs> from your own experience, how people were with email, you know, getting the message out right away. So even those protocols, I think, would have a but, probably but, minimal but, but should we have such an office? I mean, what, what do you guys think? I mean, is, is this a, an important enough problem to merit the expenditure of some money and effort to have a, sort of a, a small group, maybe two people, three people? I don't know, but some group somewhere that considers this eventuality? Or is that entirely too speculative, in which case, why are we sitting here? <laughs> somehow feel the United Nations today has it hands full, so I don't know whether they are. Yeah, it may not be their top priority, this is true. <laughs> it's very definitely not yeah. their top priority. Every time yeah. we've gone to them with these protocols, they have shown no interest. No, but I think it is a good idea to have uh, a group of experts, anthropologists and philosophers and scientists as well, who, um, who contemplate all of these various scenarios beforehand. That's why we're doing this uh, now. It's always better to be prepared than not to be prepared and to think about these things. One of the things I didn't mention is that uh, uh, early actions are very important. You know, uh, for, for example, with the contact with the uh, Cortez uh, with the Aztecs. Uh, you know, you can go down one lane or you can go down another lane and the early actions are very important and the more you pre can prepare for those, the more likely you'll have a positive outcome, I think. Do you think, do you think the Aztecs could have prepared for an alternative response, <laughs> Well, they were the Spaniards, might have. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what, uh, let, 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 let us do indeed open it up to the audience. Travis, there's a gentleman right behind the pillar over here who had his hand up first. Yes. Yeah. Right. Here's my yeah. Oh. I think under, underlying this, especially in the, uh, the mention of various critics uh, who I think remained unnamed at that point, but might be interesting to know where they come from and what their own agenda is, is the question of patronage and the question of legitimacy uh, in terms of what you do. Uh, certainly establishing any kind of activity that requires resources um, implies to other people that resources go elsewhere than what they may have in their own you know, agenda. So uh, if, if you want to suggest a, uh, a continuing center or a continuing effort or some sort of clearinghouse mechanism, how can you uh, show that it is in uh, everyone's best interest? Yeah. Interesting question. Does somebody want to take that on? Yeah, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like a carbon rod. I'm only a moderator. <laughs> Uh, well, that, I mean, that's an interesting point. Would they have their own agenda? And the, the uh, public, at least in the United States, and this is all somewhat anecdotal, but is very skeptical that the government would be open about this sort of thing. So if it were a government committee, you know, established somewhere under the aegis of some government agency, there would be skepticism in this country, I think. Uh, I, there was a poll in 2002 conducted by CNN and Time in which one of the questions was, do you think that the government is keeping secret evidence for extraterrestrials. And uh, the overwhelming majority of the American public thought that was true. Okay. So indeed, I mean, I think you, you have a well-motivated question there, if I've understood it correctly. Uh, but on the other hand, and apparently the UN doesn't enjoy tremendous status on this panel right now, but one, one, could, one could do this maybe at a university even. I mean, maybe there'd be a little bit of government money for it, but just to study the societal aspects of this question. Because there's no aspect of, and certainly in the case of SETI, intelligent life, there's no aspect of that problem that more interests the public than the question of what will it mean to me if you succeed. Their interest in that, I can safely say, trumps their interest in the details of the cross-correlation receivers we use to try and find the signal. Oh, we should also mention that uh, in terms of microbes, there are the planetary protection protocols. Uh, in terms of uh, what you do if you find uh, what you do if you find a microbe, you certainly don't want to con contaminate uh, what you're looking for, and you certainly don't want to have back contamination in the Andromeda strain scenario. So, 
uh, planetary protection protocols, which NASA and other institutions have, do play into this, but they don't go very far beyond that. Yeah. Can I, you look like you're about to say. Yeah. Um, I think I, I have mixed feelings about the, this project because, uh, like, if we take seriously this idea that it will take a lot of time to establish, and then what would the committee do? So maybe something more long term too, that they would uh, so, uh, synthesize each like each year the the results, the progress of in astrobiology, and. Um, yeah, regarding the, the constitution of the group, it should be, I think, as international and as diverse as possible so that it's less biased. It, there's a question that's frequently asked in, in connection with the microbial, the possibility of microbial life. If you were to find, for example, life, extant life, life that's still there under the landscapes of Mars, right? You go down 100 feet and all these bacteria down there. And, uh, you know, 100, 200 years from now, you have the capability of, for example, colonizing parts of Mars. But if you do that, suppose that that obliterates some of the, uh, you know, the, the biota that's already there. Should you do that? That kind of thing. Those kinds of questions have also led to some, some conferences, but I don't know that there's any mechanism for deciding what to do. I think there are. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's worth of a big debate, of course, but, um, well, First, there is a scientific interest that you should not spoil. Like when you, when in archaeology, when there is a great site of interesting things, and some uh, uh, businessmen want to build some building to make some business, uh, there should be a way to, to let the archaeologists do their job before. But on the other hand, you can't stop the businessmen who have the money to to do the thing. And I think the uh, there is uh, a good um, a good line of argument from the idea of uh, thermodynamics ethics, that um, uh, which was proposed by Robert Freitas, um, that uh, we should the, the most advanced the most um, uh, advanced uh, species have a, a right and a duty to. To, um, to, to spread advanced life, yeah. or to and transform matter and energy into questions. more advanced things. You almost seem disappointed that there's not a UN office. Don't you think it's premature? If you look at something like near-Earth objects and asteroid hits, we've been studying those now scientifically for almost 20 years to gather the data about asteroids and whether they're hazardous to Earth. And we have lots of evidence of things hitting Earth historically and even recently. So where's the beef? Show me the meat. I want to see the data before I set up an office in the UN. Don't you think that that's more appropriate? Well, Margaret, you're part of the planetary protection uh, effort, and you're worried about the kind of forward and backward contamination that Steve has uh, already mentioned, and that's being funded by NASA, and we don't have any, ex you know, any evidence that there's any danger of contamination at least coming back, and yet that effort is being made. So, so why not make some effort for, you know, the, if you will, the societal impact of, of discovering that there's life out there? Don't scientists do that already? Scientists and social scientists? Scienti scientists certainly speculate about it plenty. See it here, right? But the question is, should there be some dedicated effort? That was only the idea. <clears throat> uh, thanks for your talks. Uh, I want to uh, call attention to the elephant in the room. And I mean that not just facetiously, but almost literally. It seems like all the arguments, assumptions, analogies, examples that we've been talking about so far have to do with either finding microbes or finding intelligent life, which is assumed to be some kind of life that is humanoid. We're talking about contact between two human cultures <clears throat> or between Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal. Um, but the big gap here is in terms of how we relate to the other animals on this planet. And no one seems to be willing to talk about that. And I be interested in, in why you think historically um, astrobiology hasn't always um, 
considered uh, those exemplars and that whole realm of science to be something that might be relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, well, you stumped the panel. Right? I don't know why. <laughs> I, uh, but of course, there are studies, as you know. Uh, in, well, dolphins have figured large, at least in the SETI enterprise, because they were considered an, an analogy, if you will, that if you can't understand them, how, what hope do you have of understanding some sort of you know, otherworldly intelligence? So there have, there have been some studies, but I, maybe you could refine your point a little bit. Because you get what I'm saying. I mean, the, yeah, dolphins have historically been of interest to SETI and its biology. Dolphins are interested in everyone. And um, apart from that, there really hasn't been any active research in the area of astrobiology on the evolution of intelligence. And Well, I think uh, uh, we're going to be talking about this, af this, this afternoon, right? That's the afternoon <laughs> session. But uh, it's an interesting historical question why astrobiology hasn't, uh, hasn't considered that, uh, that very robustly, at least. Um, but it's an interesting research question. Yeah. I, I let, let me offer one thing. It may be just a matter of finding the keys under the street lamp. You know, you look for the kind of life that's easy to find, and microbes in great quantity. Uh, produce evidence that you can measure from many light years of distance. And so could a technologically capable civilization. So you say, okay, now I know what experiment to do. To consider an experiment that might find, you know, large mammals in the oceans of other worlds is, is hard if they're not in the solar system, I think. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I got the feeling that what you were, maybe I'm wrong, that you are really interested in our relations to all these animals, intelligent <coughs> or not, on this planet, mm -hmm. more than finding an elephant or a dolphin on another planet. So uh, astrobiology, by almost by definition, is relating to extraterrestrial entities. And I believe that there are uh, scientific disciplines, other scientific disciplines, that either are or are supposed to, to be more aware of, of you know, life, life on Earth. So I, I think that that's, that has to be uh, made clear first. I think, I think that's an you know, interesting response. I, one I may not remember. Um, and that If we are going to use analogies, examples, and speaking about the framework, our mindset of mm -hmm. astrobiology, um, I just see a big gap in our thinking that needs to be filled out a bit more. Because, yeah, there may not be animals on another planet, but, there, but that's, the, that's not a relevant issue. The issue is the continuity of life on Earth. Well, one thing I will say, your suggestion that we ought to do more research into the evolution of intelligence, yes. I think is very well founded. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the most controversial thing in this enterprise, if you're speaking about intelligent life. It's, you know, I'll give you a million worlds with bacteria, how many of them ever cook up something as clever as a dolphin? Um, Mary, did you? Yeah, yeah. Travis, if you could.
right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that we don't conflate searching for intelligent life with astrobiology. They're not the same. And so I think, um, I think astrobiology thinks about ecosystems and certainly is interested in other animals as they are an ecosystem, but not as they necessarily lead to a civilization or an ability for someone to communicate. Um, and I also just want to, not making a plug for um, microbes, but just point out that one can imagine a planet that has microbes and no complex life or intelligent life, but I, I don't think you have a single scientist that could imagine a life that had complex or intelligent life that didn't also have microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, in our own history, which is fortunately the only sample of life that we know is here on Earth, uh, we had microbes for maybe four billion years before the flash of a, of a human. And so um, the likelihood, well, I'll, I'll stop there with just those points. The other opportunity. Good, good point, but what, what about a planet that's been colonized by thinking machines? No microbes. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> okay, there are plenty of people here, yeah. Since the scientific revolution has been said that there have been several blows to man, man, human beings' pride, you mentioned Copernicus, Darwin, others have mentioned Freud and so forth. But I was wondering, uh, as far as if there is a Arthur C. Clarke childhood Zen scenario of vastly superior extraterrestrial intelligence, what are the historical analogies of imperialism, for example, or the effects of uh, European uh, uh, contacts with African, uh, South American, and other uh, uh, cultures around the world, quite different from the scientific uh, uh, effects of the scientific community in these places. What about the effects on the traditional values and, 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 and uh, uh, belief systems and so forth of the indigenous peoples, in other words, us, which were profoundly disruptive, profoundly dispiriting and demoralizing. Think of the American Indians on the reservations today. I mean, uh, we're not going to, I don't think there's a kind of a rosy scenario like in E.T., you know, where we just go blissfully off and, and learn all these wonderful things. I think it, it's going to be profound metaphysical and pseudo-quasi-religious and so forth and societal uh, massive disruptions in our culture to find experience of uh, uh, technologically and scientifically far superior civilization. Commentary, we have several people who sort of talked around that, that, that question. Yeah, so, so would you suggest in order not to take this risk not to Explore. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we shouldn't be, have such a sanguine view of, of you know, the marvelous progress that we will encounter. It will be enormously exciting to, science, to scientists and philosophers, of course, but I'm thinking of the masses of black Yeah. You know, what sort of effects is that going to destabilize the effects of that? But finally, we're just a puny little uh, species uh, that will face it as. Okay. Uh, for the people who couldn't hear, he just questions the sanguine attitude about discovering life. When, you know, would the masses find it such good news? Yeah, there are some uh, theories. I didn't talk about this, but there are some theories of societal impact of uh, various magnitudes. Uh, there's one um, by Jean Ladriere, who's not very well known, but uh, has to do with the uh, uh, societal impact um, he, he's a philosopher, a uh, French philosopher, and uh, his main thing was that you have, uh, before uh, the impact, you, you, of course you have a pre-impact scenario where you have various values and assumptions and so on, then you have the, uh, the event occur, and then afterwards it's all reconstructed. So uh, that's fine to some extent, but of course if it's, a, if it's an event that's really uh, destructive or, or overwhelming, then that may all go out the door. Uh, so you could set up, I think, a sort of a classification system of how how powerful uh, you know the event is going to be, and come up with scenarios uh, there. Uh, but there are various theories of societal impact, especially having to do with science and technology, uh, that could be employed there to begin to address that. I think. 
I don't know offhand what a good analogy would be. <laughs> well, I think Clement spoke of the, there's a, you know, a large parameter space yeah. of possibilities here. I mean, discovering microbes on Titan is one scenario. Having the you know, aliens land in New Jersey is a different scenario. And obviously, if the perceived uh, importance is different. So um, getting back to the one topic where uh, you're talking about um, um, authoritative sources. In other words, a life was discovered um, and the word gets out. And of course, social media is going to dominate everything. So it's going to be all kinds of sets of information and a range of, of uh, belief and disbelief and outrageous statements, etc., within the social media. But authoritative sources, do we have those? Is the NAI speak for microbial? Does SETI seek, uh, speak for uh, intelligent life discoveries? You know, do we have those developed, and is that really the way the social media will go by looking for those? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Who's, who's going? Suppose a discovery is made next week. Who's, who speaks to that? Where, where does the public get its information? No, I, I would like just to say and uh, about the case, uh, to, to say a few words about the case of the Marson Rock mm -hmm. in 1996. And um, people came, I mean, the, the researchers published their results. And there was a big, of course, noise around it. But I think that science took its course, and other people um, examined other slices of the rocks, and then there was debate in the scientific paper. It came out also in the public media. So when you talk about authoritative source, I think that the question of authority and science is, is, not, is not an easy one, because science is actually involved in debate, and, and people criticize each other. And uh, so I, I'm not sure whether you have to expect a situation where there is a discovery, somebody comes up and stands on the podium and said, this and that happened. Because I think that it's, it will be a scientific discovery and, and yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to say? Yeah, I, I think part of it is a question of how much the media listens to the authority. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the case of the Mars rock, uh, of course, the press was all over it at the beginning, but five or ten years later, when it was gradually down, you know, discovered that probably was not, there was not so much uh, brouhaha over it. So uh, I think that may just in part be the nature of the media. Yeah. I think the experience with the media, indeed, is that, look, this story breaks very quickly. Within an hour or so, it's a big story. And they go through their Rolodexes and they say, all right, whom, whom do we know that's a reliable authority to pontificate on this subject? Whether they know anything about it, I can assure you that, and you know that. And, and they will be the first responders, and they will say stuff based on very little information over the course of days, of course, that, will, uh, you know, that, that information will deepen. But it, it, it's going to be chaotic at the beginning, and I don't think there's any avoiding that. I mean, the IAA sets up these committees that are supposed to respond to all this. They will be all entirely too slow and unknown to the media. One, yeah, I wanted to build on uh, Mary's good point about astrobiology as a discipline and, and, and how much of astrobiology is wrapped into discoveries that we're making right here on Earth about extremophile life, about the diversity of bacteria, the locations that life can thrive. Um, and so I was wondering maybe if the philosophers and the historians among us could, could maybe share um, a little bit about how the discoveries we've made here on Earth about different ways that life can uh, begin to thrive and survive and exist, um, impact our worldview and also impact how we think about uh, this problem of discovery. Well, I'm not sure how much impact, uh, again, it depends uh, what segment of society you're talking about. I'm not sure that the masses of people care much about extremophiles. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, how much impact has it had on the common person? Probably not very much. But on the other hand, uh, it's had a great impact in the uh, scientific community. So I think when you're talking about impact, 
not only do you have to parse the various scenarios of discovery, you also have to parse <laughs> what part of the population you're talking about. And this is what you have to do. We'll talk more about this uh, this afternoon, uh, or is it tomorrow? Tomorrow, I guess, when we talk about theological impact. Uh, different segments of the population will be uh, uh, impacted in, in different ways. So society, of course, is not monolithic, as we, as we all know. Um, nor would we necessarily want it to be, but the impacts, therefore, will be different. Yeah, but to, to answer your question, I think simply it's, uh, it, it, open up, it opens up the search space. It means that life is robust to many environments, so it's, uh, it's good news. It's, uh, yeah, uh, life uh, has many chances to be somewhere. Yeah, I, I would just like to, to say in this connection that worldview, you asked about the impact on worldview, uh, Worldview, I'm afraid, is not democratic in the sense, for example, I talked about the evolutionary worldview. How many people in this world support evolution? This country contributes to this, as we know greatly, of not supporting evolution. But if you, if you poll humanity, most people reject evolution, but still, what we call the evolutionary worldview is here and very strong among scientists, among philosophers of science. So uh, it's unfortunate that this is the case. And I think that many uh, projects taken by uh, the AAAS and, and I just heard from Connie and the Smithsonian Institute to educate the public, to have outreach programs educating and, and transferring information about science are very important. But there is this gap between a sort of elite, scientific, philosophical, cultural elite, and uh, the rest, rest of humanity, I, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I thank you all on the panel for, for bringing such enlightenment to us. I want to echo something I heard the young lady on my left say and the gentleman in, in the front. Uh, one, I am concerned about the arrogance that we bring to discovery and exploration. Um, I don't think we have a great track record as a species. And so I would hope that there's, there is a place where um, we can discuss the moral um, impact of what we are trying to do in the name of science, discovery, exploration, and the like. But the other thing that I wanted to mention was, is there, ask, is there someone or a, a body that is looking at the actual definition of life? Does it always have to be carbon-based biological life as we think of it? A, and B, is there someone or a body of someones talking about the nature of intelligence itself? And what does that look like? Is it, I, I'm feeling a, um, probably an inescapable anthropocentric bias in, in what we're talking about here. And, and so I think it, it addresses some of the other issues that were raised. Yeah. So you're all anxious to get to the afternoon session, right? right Which exactly. is exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> well, we'll be talking about intelligence and, uh, and life. Uh, of, uh, I don't think there's any official body that talks about these things, but plenty of philosophers that have a lot to say about the nature of life and sometimes differing from what the scientists have to say about the nature of life. Of course, the scientists have to uh, have an operational definition if they're going to Mars to look for life and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm sure we're going to get into this in detail this afternoon. Yeah, two good questions. I, there's always the, the Judge Potter approach to life or intelligence. You'll recognize it when you see it. <laughs> not, not a good one. Or, or not. This woman has written a lot about the, what does it mean to be alive? Yes, yes. You, you can, but you can't do it without a microphone, yeah. Carol.
Mind you, we can hear you. So I'm going to pick up where Lori left off in response to your human analogs for first contact. Uh, the Aztec, for example, and the Spaniards. And one of the things that's really remarkable about our species is how incredibly inbred it is. We all know now we're like cheetahs. We went through a bottleneck about 70 or 80,000 years ago in which uh, there were only about 6,000 people survived it. So we're all very, very similar, despite um, the racial dissension we have. We're really remarkably similar. And our perceptual systems are extraordinarily sim similar. Our sensory systems, uh, our social systems, and, I could, and our language, I could go on and on. So these kinds of contact analogs presuppose creatures who are shockingly like us, not just a little anthro Pomorphic, but shockingly like us. And I think uh, the reason I would pick up in Lori's point is we don't really know, and I'm sure Lori would agree with this, how smart dolphins are. Uh, they are extraordinarily different from us. They, have their, they communicate via sonar. A lot of their intelligence is spent in social interactions. They're very complex in their social interactions. Similarly, we have a very small range of uh, spectra in which we can see. Uh, we know Hymenopera can see in the ultraviolet range. We look at a dull white flower. They see a magnificently striped flower. I would think that if you really want to study how to have first contact, what you might expect how to communicate with aliens, you would spend time not just trying to communicate with dolphins, um, but you might spend time studying how you, to communicate with them, studying where it's successful and where it's not. Because uh, we are really remarkably similar, uh, and I think that many of these analogs are very unlikely to hold uh, in a case of first contact with aliens who come from a very different environment, because we are all evolved to fit our own. So, so, so your question is? Should, you know, are, are we too anthropocentric? Shouldn't we be spending much more money uh, studying, as Lori suggests, I'm back to her point, uh, interactions with, say, dolphins, creatures that are really quite different from us in terms of their sensory systems or social structure, et cetera? No, That's I, my question. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, I, I alluded to that. Uh, to, to some extent, I think we study the culture contacts like the Aztecs. That's the one you always hear about uh, to debunk them. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that, uh, although I think that you can uh, get uh, good information about uh, communication and language and, uh, and uh, concepts, conceptual differences and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and that's why I also mentioned Neanderthal, which would be, be nice to know exactly how they interacted, uh, because it is a different species at least. But I think you're absolutely right to go to uh, you know, other animals, uh, the cephalopods and, and other, that's, May, may be where the best analogies are because they have a totally different perceptual and uh, you know uh, process. Well, they are different. There's a big controversy about that. <laughs> they're not. Home, they're 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 both genus Homo, but sorry. Okay. Well, I I bet there's some controversy about that <laughs> classification. 2.9 percent. Right. <laughs> so, you know, we have Neanderthal ancestors. Right, that's right. Yes. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Additional questions? Come on. A lot of the questions have been from panelists, so let's hear from some people who are not panelists. I wanted to ask Dr. Vidal if he could expand on his comment that we have a duty of colonization if we are alone. Yes. Um, so again, it's, uh, it comes from uh, an attempt to universal ethics based on uh, thermodynamics and the idea is to preserve energy and to make the most of it. So um, it means that uh, if there is uh, another solar system near us and the sun shines and and the energy of this, uh, sorry, the, its star sh shine, and the energy of the star is dissipated and is ultimately lost. And the idea of thermoethics is to make the most of this energy and to use it to make life, intelligence, and something rich. Who, whose idea is it, by the way? Uh, who? Robert Freitas developed it, and um, other before Fazon. I, I, I take it the questioner, 
you may not be in total agreement that uh, we have this imperative to colonize. Is, am I reading into what you just said? Yeah, I guess I'm still dubious. Okay. Yeah. Well, there is something called the Fermi paradox, but nobody seems to have brought it up, so I won't. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my question is about um, problems relating to finding intelligent life, and something that hasn't really come up is that intelligent life will have its own agency and its own kind of decision making, um, and potentially even choose to hide from us, which raises the question, part of preparing for discovery is reflecting on whether we are actually ready to be found or whether we might be in a galactic quarantine where intelligent life is concerned. And so part of preparing for, for discovery might be to reflect on public policy, on the, you know, how is it that we interact um, as sentient life on a planet? And Clement brought up, brought up this wonderful example on this notion of, of planetary identity. Um, so if we are going to um, be viewed by intelligent life that will make decisions on, one, whether to contact us, two, what nature that contact may take, um, the way um, humans interact um, a as a species of, of being dysfunctional or not, and I speak as a, as a Brit on the eve of the Scots referendum, well, you know, it's going on. Um, we're not terribly good at... Intera interacting with um, one another. And this is um, where I wonder if there's a place to talk about how we need to actually be acting on Earth so that if and when there is contact, that um, it then proceeds in a way we might want. I mean, someone brought up kind of weaponry, um, just briefly, and um, we, we looked at the stats of... Um, different kinds of levels of technological development, the odds that we are so close technologically that doing a bit more research will allow us to have a military advantage is zero. You know, the astronomical terms of that, that you know, we're not going to be that close um, anyway. Well, well uh, let, let me see if I can summarize your question, because I think your question is, should we not, in fact, be looking more carefully at our own, if you will, behavior uh, in, in connection with the possibility of discovering life outside. And maybe they're being cryptic simply because of our own behavior, and this is a motivation to study that more. Did I, did I get your question? Something like that, <laughs> um, but how um, the ways in which, um, I mean, in terms of making recommendations for the policy, um, I mean, policy about extraterrestrials is merely a continuum going from very, very local policy with your own neighbor through the foreign policy, through the yeah. um, so Okay, well, well, let me just say very, very briefly. I mean, they may make choices about whether they want to know Right, us. yeah. Well, they, they may, and I, get, I have to say, I get an email at least twice a week from somebody who says, you'll never find the aliens because our behavior is so bad they won't want to have any uh, dealings with us. <laughs> this is anthropocentric in the extreme, in my opinion. It's like the ants thinking nobody's ever going to study us because we're always at war, right? And yet, E.O. Wilson spends plenty of time with those ants. So, well, it's true, we have agency, but, but let me just short circuit all that because I, I think that what short circuits all that is the fact that they don't know anything about any of that. They're too, far, they're too far away to know anything about what we're doing today. So I think what you're talking about in part, in, in part at least, is diplomacy. And uh, uh, certainly we... Right, and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We do have people, uh, in fact, one in the audience here, Michael Michaud, who is a former State Department diplomat who's written extensively on this. So uh, there is uh, interest in that, and I'd refer you to his, I don't know if he wants to say anything now on this point, but uh, he has an excellent book on uh, communication with extraterrestrial intelligence, which includes some of the, and he's been involved in the uh, SETI protocols and that sort of thing. So I think there is something to look at there with regard to uh, diplomacy that... Uh, if we're going to be preparing for discovery, we may want to take a look at it. Yeah. We, we have about five minutes. Let's take a... F yeah. Clement, um, can you um, expound a little bit on the Star of Oa concept? Um, it's far out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the main argument is to extrapolate two, two trends of uh, our own civilization development. The one is the increase of energy. 
Uh, and so that's the Kardashev scale that uh, an, an intelligent civilization becomes at a certain point able to, to master the energy of its parent star. So it's energy use which increases, like the, the diagram that I showed. And the second argument is the, uh, the increase of, of technologies and their densification that we, we the, the, the major scientific and technological progress today are due to our, our abilities to miniaturize uh, more and more, if you think of biotechnologies, nanotechnologies. So I pushed this reasoning to the extreme that an advanced civilization would be able to manipulate very small scales of, um, of matter, uh, nuclear scales and possibly below. And so if you put the two together, you have the idea of a very dense uh, body which uses the energy of its parent star. And uh, I looked in the literature and I, I found something which corresponded, which are called interacting binary systems. So it's, it's a binary star system where you have one big companion star and one dense object, which can be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. And there is an energy flow which goes from the companion star to the dense object. And this energy flow is irregular. And there are some also some ejection of, uh, of, of matter, which can be um, jets or, or, or novae. Uh, and so this, this displays uh, the primitive properties of uh, metabolism. And so that's why it's an interesting uh, open question if it's like a macroscopic uh, yeah. metabolic system. So, so the bottom line is uh, he thinks certain double stars may be showing evidence of intelligence, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, not accepted by most Astronomers, of course, but I give, I, I give uh, the uh, points for being thinking out of the box. In the same way that uh, that uh, Freeman Dyson thought out of the box with with, with the Dyson sphere. So uh, it's a, it's a hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about this whole field is uh, it's very fertile with new ideas. Yes. Jason, I think you want to tell people about uh, what happens next. So we're out of time for this session. So we have reached the end of panel number one, so please um, join me in uh, thanking all of our discussants. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.